You better be listening to Slizoids or I must break you. Co to je? Zvaní se z neba. A to je masový vrah? Laše. Vražil každý den a taky každou noc. Tak já se vězná v nemky, či je vždyť mi na nádražu. Buď jen na nás ješet, nikoji. Panem, jen nechzetež a filozofie i kérdež pro vás jsou. Nevezetesen arról, hogy a szóban forgó hangrendszer kutatások révén elkerülhetetlenül eljutunk egy bizonyos hitvizsgálatig. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Sleezoids, the podcast where we go down the rabbit hole of 20th century genre fare from the most influential canon classics to the trashiest exploitation films we can get our hands on and invite you to tag along in helping us create a canon of sleaze. Each week is a double feature grindhouse style where we discuss two films loosely related by subject, genre, actor, filmmaker, or franchise. And at the end of each episode, along with our honorary Sleezoids, which you can become by subscribing on Patreon. We're doing some uh, strange body horror, so join that sleaze, baby. We decide on all the official ratings and rankings for every film that we cover. Patreon subscribers also get an on-air shout-out and two bonus episodes every single month, which we are in our fifth year of. There's something like 100-plus bonus episodes, as well as our bonus transmission series, where we talk about new release genre films. And, uh, yeah, so if you're interested in that at all, patreon.com slash Sleezoids podcast. And speaking uh, of which, we had a lot of people make the jump this week, so let's give them their shout-outs here. We had uh, DV Yes, we had uh, D. Batrini. Oh boy! Um, All right, Leg- Legley G. There's a Z in there. Sorry, it kind of messed me up. Um, <laughs> we have uh, Peter Hughes. We have Eric Greenwood. We have Joel Marks. Uh, we have Hoops Dan. Uh, We have Kian Chang, who uh, actually upgraded from $5 a month to $10 a month and is going to be joining us for the virtual screening uh, that we do in the last Thursday of every month, which is always a lot of fun. And uh, last but not least, we had Stephanie Monahan. So thanks to so much to all of you folks for signing up. I hope you guys are uh, enjoying those bonus episodes and we appreciate the support. Yes, thank Um, you. The other plug... For the week, as always, is uh, Apple Podcasts. If you guys are listening on Apple Podcasts, uh, and you know, I see the stats. I see you right now listening on Apple Podcasts. Scroll down to the very bottom right now. Give us a good old rating and review down there. It helps us climb the ranks and find new listeners. Uh, and the very last plug is merch. If you guys like the poster art that local base out of Toronto horror artist Trevor Henderson did for the show, you can get that basically put on anything that you can think of. And we've got some freaks out there. We've had some people buy some pens. We've had some people buy some pillows, uh, shirts, posters, notebooks. Uh, The link to that is in the description, uh, as well as over at sleezoidspodcast.com. But... Welcome back to another week. That was your intro. As always, I am your host, uh, Josh Lewis, and joining me also, as always, is my co-host. Jamie Miller. Welcome back, everybody. Welcome. Uh, I think two weeks ago would have been the last time uh, you folks over on the main feed would have heard from us, and we would have had special guest film critic Nick Pinkerton on the show for the first time, and he was bringing with him a uh, very underseen, mm-hmm. underrated we love when people bring on films that have less than a thousand views on Letterboxd and yeah. we have to, you know, find the shittiest DVD rip, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, on the internet that we can locate. And uh, Nick did not disappoint on that front, bringing with him Police Python 357, which was a sort of French neo noir procedural film that was sort of like if Jean Pierre Melville took a stab at like a Dirty Harry style film. And uh, we paired that with The Bell from Hell or A Bell from Hell, which was this uh, Spanish gothic horror kind of revenge film about a guy who uh, <laughs> uh, escapes a mental asylum and uh, gets revenge on his family who locked him up by playing a series of really intense practical jokes on them that, you know, uh, (laughs) feel like Italian horror. So (laughs) we had a lot of fun breaking both uh, those down. uh, True Sleezoid's fashion, there's just, there's plenty of incest. So that's the sell. There there you go, guys. (laughs) 
There you go. Um, <laughs> but yes, that was uh, two weeks ago with uh, with Nick Pickerton. If you haven't heard that episode, I don't know what you guys are doing. It's over on the main feed. Go check it out. Uh, but then last week over on the Patreon exclusively for the patrons, um, we decided that we had been sticking around a little bit too much in kind of like the 80s and 90s and we wanted to remember some classics. So we plugged in a huge episode, oh, yeah. uh, an episode that... Um, a friend of the pod Spencer kind of floated uh, by me once and it kind of got lodged in my brain and I was decided it was time that we were going to do it. So we did Night of the Hunter 1955 directed by Charles Lawton and we paired that with The Innocents from 1961 directed by Jack Clayton. Both very um, interesting black and white oh my god won't, won't someone please think of the children uh <laughs> films that were uh you know very dark and very disturbing uh, especially for uh the eras that they came out in so we uh, we had uh i think we went pretty long on that episode so if you oh, haven't yeah, heard that one so and you're interested patreon.com slash these Oids podcast that was last week's bonus episode but moving on to this week, we have a very special uh, returning guest. This is his fourth time on the show. Everyone Ooh. should be familiar. He is a author and a filmmaker whose whose horror short Sun Gazer may or may not have even appeared on our top ten list on that's this right, show. Boy. And since and since that's come out, he's written all kinds of books and short stories, and even gotten into film programming. And I think become something of a video store guy. Um, <laughs> but uh, that guest is Perry. Roland Perry, how you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Thanks no for coming. No problem. Thanks for thanks for coming back. This is uh, this is your first t- fourth time, and you've been kind of uh, notorious on this show for bringing on <laughs> the most fucked up double features that anyone brings on. Uh, you introduced us to Tetsuo the Iron Man, which quickly became one of our favorite films that we've covered on the show. Uh, you brought Midori and got TikTok kids doing the Midori challenge. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> All me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the last time you were on, you brought one of the most disgusting films I've ever seen in my life, uh, Mermaid <laughs> in a Manhole. Um, Ugh, so thank you. So much. Um, You're welcome. And, uh, you know, d- d- despite all of the suffering you have caused us and our listeners, we bring <laughs> you back every time because you always bring something very interesting. Um, so what two films have you brought with you this week and why did you pair them together? Well, as you mentioned in the past, I've mostly brought on um, very disgusting Japanese exploitation films. And I wanted to throw a little curveball this time and do something a little bit different. So instead of going to the the scummiest, um, gutter-crusted exploitation films I could find, I chose two movies that are the closest thing to like a... um, genre transcendence art movies that I can think of. And that's uh, <laughs> The Cremator and Werkmeister Harmonies. Uh, the Cremator by Jiraj Hers and Werkmeister Harmonies by Bellatar. And I chose these two films because they are movies that use uh, the visual and narrative language of horror and mystery films and then contort them in very strange ways to tell very, very offbeat fables about fascism in Central Europe. Hell yeah! Now these these were this was a very interesting pairing, and watching them back to back, it was easy to see that you know both definitely take this you know sort of Eastern European political history and backdrop of you know a, a, a sort of sense of resignment and brutality and you know sort of oppressive experience that you know especially the, the these two countries we're going to be talking about uh, what was originally Czechoslovakia and Hungary uh, who have long histories of, of such events and have filmmakers wrestling with those events for many years to come but then applying them with this very kind of depressive black and white kind of dreamy existentialism to them a little bit and and definitely both have very subjective forms that capture the moods and headspace of their characters they just have polar opposite characters which is why i found <laughs> yeah. this pairing really interesting because where hertz in the cremator gives way to kind of like this rapid mania tar is very much you know more of this kind of languid meditation uh to it uh but both i think were were really strong and um I'm excited to get into this because 
we'll see what everyone kind of feels like at the end. But this is the this is the rare episode for me where I was inter- introduced to two films for the first time that I think became just became two of my favorite films. Yeah, um, me too. Definitely. So <laughs> I'm uh, very excited to jump in here. So let's open up with uh, the cremator. Right. Uh, we are talking The Cremator, the 1969 Czechoslovak uh, comedy, horror, <laughs> art, comedy, drama I film. Uh, I, I don't, I, I mean, everyone labels it comedy, and there yeah. are moments that are so absurd, you're uncomfortable and you laugh, I think, but there's definitely not the first description that I would use, even I was though I think mostly you know, horrified. a lot of people do. <laughs> <laughs> It's, there is definitely some some bleakly and uh, black comedy aspects uh, in in certain elements of it. Yeah, it's definitely an absurd movie, but yes, it's not easily classified in any other terms. I don't think. So, I mean, yeah, it's hmm, kind yeah. of a horror film, and it's kind of a comedy, and it's kind of a political drama, but not really <laughs> it's I, yeah, yeah i think it's, it's a just weird united. amalgamation of all of those things like simultaneously right it's yeah. the most uneasy parts of all of those and the most um mm-hmm. uncomfortable parts of those kind of grafted together in a very strange way yeah i think it's because you get his yeah. um subjective view the entire time and mm-hmm. at times you know he's very uh you know, he is kind of a, a charismatic man and he is very uh, he comes off as lighthearted and, and joking. So I think even though we're watching something completely horrific and a man just, you know, going into genocidal madness, uh, the way that he presents it is is still kind of humorous in a way, or at least to him. Right? Yeah, well, there's well, and there's there's something to be said, too, because, you know, I uh, not that long ago, I just programmed a uh, sort of uh, film festival of of free educational Holocaust cinema. So I was mm-hmm. really uniquely prepared for this film going into it. And there, there is something to be said about a lot of the people who made Holocaust cinema around this time that, um, there was something so overwhelmingly large and absurd about what happened in the Holocaust that they had kind of no way to, I guess, depict it in, as they saw it, a normal way that it was just so overwhelmingly large and brutal to the point that, you know, it was, it was inconceivable unless you were to heighten the reality of what you see, like your own worldview in that way. And I think that this film, which is directed by Yuri, a filmmaker named Yuri Hertz is a Slovak filmmaker, um, who's typically associated with the Czechoslovak New Wave uh, movement, which was, you know, included filmmakers like Miles Foreman and is, you know, broadly uh, kind of read as a response to, you know, sort of the more social realist style uh, cinema of, of Europe and communist countries of that era and adding this kind of darker, more absurdist stylized edge to them specifically to capture these feelings of hysteria. And it's worth noting that Hertz uh, was, of course, Jewish and um, he was a Holocaust and concentration concentration camp survivor. So one of the few um, who, you know, got to the position of actually making films, who was someone who had firsthand experience in the camps. Um, He reportedly lost around 60 members of his family, although none of them were his immediate family, fortunate uh, for him. Wow. Yeah, his, he and his immediate family were in the Ravensbrück concentration camp. And Mm. yeah, he, after World War II, uh, he went to school and then he studied puppetry and uh, film directing. At the yes, same I, I, I thought I thought the puppetry aspect was really intriguing. Yeah, there did he ever a, end up using that the puppetry um, in any films? No, I, I don't think he's made any puppet films per se in the same way that like his classmate Jan Svankmeyer did. Okay, but his movies are certainly influenced by uh, Czech puppetry and Czech puppet films, which are it's a huge tradition 
uh, going back, you know, years and years and generations and generations of Czech puppetry. Mm. Um, although you see it more in someone like Frank Meyer than in Hertz. Okay. Uh, and yeah, but yeah, he uh, he graduated and then he started working as a second unit director on some Czech films, and then he made a film called The Junk Shop that was excluded from this film called Pearls of the Deep, which was like an omnibus anthology uh, that featured a lot of the big names in the Czech New Wave, such as John Nemec and Vera Chitlova, I believe that's how you pronounce it, who directed mm-hmm. Daisies. N- N- Nemec, is that, that's the guy who did Diamonds of the Night, correct? Uh, yes, I believe so. Okay, yeah, he did, that's, do- that's, he did that's, Diamonds that, that, of the Night. Okay, because that's the other sort of big um, sort of a Czech Holocaust film yeah. um, that came out around this time, because I think it was 1964. Um, and that one definitely has some of that, um, you know, while it's not as surreal um, as this film can be sometimes, it definitely has, uh, you know, a, a really sharp editing uh, pattern to it that gets you into the headspace of these boys who are in immediate danger, like running from a, you know, they've just escaped a train uh, that was taking them from one camp to another camp. And uh, there's definitely some elements of that kind of editing pattern that you can find here when you're getting into this guy's headspace and all of a sudden, you know, you'll just have like seven cuts in quick succession and watching his mind at work and all of this. And, you know, uh, so that, that stuff's really interesting. Mm-hmm. Well, Hertz really broke away from the Czech new wave in an interesting way where he, for a period of time, almost exclusively made genre films. Uh, yeah, he did the, a, Be- a Beauty and the Beast, right? He made a Beauty and the Beast. I want to see uh, that really he made bad. This, uh, so do I. It seems incredible. Yeah. Um, he made this film called Morjana, which is like this gothic movie about twins uh, played by the same actress in a kind of um, like proto Dead Ringers way. Yeah, so so he 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 transitioned from like trying to make like art house history films to making straight up genre he, film in a way because I because he 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 did one that was like like one about an automobile car manufacturer who yeah, uses he, like he blood as oil called, for the cars or something. Yeah, it's for rock <laughs> cool. vampire, and that's like the Czech equivalent to something like Christine. Uh, yeah, that's fucking nuts. <laughs> that's awesome. He also, I mean, his future debut is this movie called Sign of the Cancer which is a movie about murders happening at a hospital where all the doctors are incompetent. That's based loosely on like the Zodiac. And so even from the start, he was making movies that are not quite, um, not quite respectable (laughs) compared to a lot of the movies that were coming out. Not the kind of thing that your country goes, we want this to represent us at the Academy Awards typically. (laughs) Right. Well, and speaking of, we'll get into where we talk about the cremator, but his movies were met with a lot of censorship. Uh, yeah, of course. The cremator, especially for what yeah. it entails. <laughs> yeah, it was it was locked up for I, I read tw- twenty years. Was it twenty years? It was sixty nine to eighty nine or something. Yeah, like I believe that. so. And I think yeah. the uh, the actress that played the wife didn't work for quite a while after this as well. I think it was her Damn. that I read on the wiki. Yeah, it yeah, is I mean, her. It's after uh, after 1971, I believe. She didn't ask for 20 years. Yeah, yeah, and I, I read it reportedly. They said um, uh, th- th- because they knew kind of like the controversial film they were making, I think it was either the, the director or the cinematographer that said, uh, do it like it's the last time that you'll act or something like that. Right. So they, they <laughs> knew what they, were, uh, what they were doing. Yeah, I mean, for, for anyone who hasn't... Um seen the cremator it is this very terrifying and you know at times surreal uh sort of uh, psychological character piece about a 1930s sort of crematorium manager in in prague who has this this pathological obsession with this idea of of uh sort of an earthly death as as a form of escape um yeah. of freedom and yeah. uh it, it it's a relief from suffering he he has mm. this sort of philosophical and ideological pursuit of turning bodies to ash <laughs> yeah, because right. it is um you know it is it is something that will save them and so naturally in this specific time period in this specific place he makes perfect sense to be a kind of character who would be drawn to or recruited to um, Nazi ideology to work in, in concentration camps and help extend um, 
this uh, this pursuit of of death uh, in, into theirs of a more sort of larger racist genocidal fanaticism, um, mm. and the this is adapted from a book that apparently is is you know apparently it's a pretty faithful adaptation except for the fact that the book is very talky, um, and it, it it sounds like. Uh, adapting this with the author of the book they kind of overhauled it to make it a little bit more uh visually interesting and to you know rewrite and incorporate some of these pure sort of uh subjective horror uh kind of elements that he wanted to get in here and really lock you inside the um headspace of this madman oh, which so is was you it know, more like uh, honestly even even well, that's than, what it sounds like. Is, it sounds like a. It sounds like a lot of the dialogue was taken straight from the book, the the mm-hmm. stuff that appears in the film. But it sounds like they just trimmed more of it. You know. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then added the, uh, the visual so, flares of like the the cutting of images really quickly to kind of get yeah. A I mean, sense I, of his head it, it sounds and, like more of. Yeah, it sounds like more of a streamlining that they went. Why have these characters say this when we have these new visual opportunities to, you know, get in there? Like the opening shit. of this film is literally, you know, like images of a leopard in a cage snarling and like textures of its of its fur and its teeth and its mouth. And then close ups of like, you know, the sort of uh, uh, wrinkles of, of his forehead and sort of these hairlines. And, yeah. you know, I would got, say- he's, he's telling his kids that cages are for dumb animals. And you're, you're really unsettled just like b- before he's even done anything creepy. <laughs> right. Yeah. And as mentioned on the episode already, this movie is entirely locked into his headspace. So it's something like yeah. to take an example, like Taxi Driver, where the whole movie, everything you see is the way Travis Bickle sees it. And this it's everything you see is the way this man, Carol Kopfrinkel. I believe uh, sees it. Yes, and hold on. I I I, I wrote it out sonically. Okay. It's like cope cope for Kingle. <laughs> cope for Kingle. Yeah, Carell cope, for, cope Kingle. for Kingle. And as mentioned, yeah, he works at this crematorium, and he's very devoted to it, and has this obsession with like the Tibetan Book of the Dead and Tibetan Buddhism, and is yes. very frequently hallucinating the Patola Palace. <laughs> and we're just kind of locked in a room with him for an hour and 40 minutes as we see him basically become courted to Nazism and then become, in the end, an architect of the, uh, the ovens at the camps. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, which is, you know, it's a... It's interesting because I was reading up kind of around the time, some of the contemporary reviews at the time, because there was a lot of praise, but I was curious what people's general reaction to this was, because I really hadn't seen, you know, there, there's precedent, you know, we've, we've covered a film like Peeping Tom on this show, which I think has a little bit of that, um, you know, it has elements where it gets into those wide angle POV shots of this mm-hmm. character who has this sort of compulsion to, you know, uh, uh, to, to, kill people and that's why even though this guy's version is is of serial murder is is very different and he kind of builds up to it by the end of the film he doesn't kind of start out that way but there's there's precedent for this kind of subjectivity in this character that we're that we're yeah. seeing here but i hadn't seen it done with i guess this kind of you know realistic historical kind of backdrop and it actually seemed yeah. like that element kind of disturbs people a little bit because they i guess they felt like you know, there's no way that like one dude was the architect of <laughs> the ovens he used right. in the Holocaust. Right. Um, yeah. So th- I guess they found that I sort of ridiculous to the point of maybe even being offensive, um, where I don't think they, I guess, uh, realize that I guess part of the sort of absurdity of it feels like the point in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yeah. overall, I think it, like separate from, you know, the, the, the realistic historical context, I think it's mostly just about how someone could be completely deluded into believing they're doing something good, even mass genocide. Um, and so I think, you know, using the kind of dreamlike editing that they do, and, and he even sees, you know, like the, the apparition of death throughout this entire thing. Um, <laughs> it just makes yeah, it feel death. more subjective. Yeah. And yes. himself as Buddha. Uh, talking yeah. about yes, the new Dalai <laughs> Lama. Yeah. 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 Um, it's, it, as mentioned, like, because we're just locked down with him and he's being manipulated. It's really incredible how the movie at once shows 
him being manipulated, while also you can see how he isn't able to tell that he's being manipulated. Yeah. Because his character is like, he's like a little boy, basically. Like, he's very petty and cruel. And with yeah. his misreading of Tibetan Buddhism, he arms himself with this idea that, like, he knows everything. And he's just extremely arrogant about it, while he's also very naive. So that allows him to be really easily manipulated by other people in the movie. Especially a friend of his, who is like... A, a diehard Nazi party believer who very easily is able to convince Carell to, you know, do all these horrible things by just kind of stroking his ego and tweaking his logic a little bit. And the whole yeah, time I mean, that's my thinks favorite that's element. all him. Yeah. Is, it, it, is how easy it is and how very few tweaks the Nazi has to make to his kind of philosophy and ideology by, you know, to to actually get him interested in doing what he wants him to do, because he he essentially like goes up to him and is like, uh, you know, you you kind of believe in, you know, these these sort of state laws of of cremating bodies as 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 a burial. Right. Well, you know, Germany also does that. You know, we're, we're interested in in even developing that law a little bit, you know, taking it a little bit further. And he's like, oh, that's interesting. And then there's a scene where he goes to uh, he, he, he's intended to kind of go undercover into a Hanukkah celebration where he is going into, you know, uh, spy on the sort of local, uh, Jewish neighbors that he has. And there is an element to this where he actually starts observing sort of like their rituals. And there's these very, uh, very pointed images of paintings on the wall showing their burial rituals, which obviously they, they don't do cre- cremation. Um, and they, uh, their rule is actually, I guess, kind of like the opposite of cremation, where it's like the body has to be fully in the ground, yeah. like really fast. <laughs> so you yeah. get the paintings of them all around the bed and putting the body in the ground. And he is... So he, it, it, to him, it's almost like it, there's a logical conclusion being drawn here of, well, there's one side who believes in my art and these, this thing I love to do and this thing I think is powerful and good for humanity. And there's a side that doesn't. And the one that does it says that they want me to use it on the other one. He just, you know, it just, it, it just very easily, the math gets done in his head and the way that the movie very like formally gets you into that as well. Like in that particular sequence, there's like, scenes where he is like sitting in the room and then all of a sudden the Nazi is like in his ear from a completely separate room, like talking to him, asking, you know, he's, he's sitting there listening to these sort of like Jewish rituals. He's listening to the Hebrew prayers. He's watching them like, uh, you know, uh, d- d- hand out the challah and everything. And then he's even uh, complimenting the th- singing th- and stuff like that. Yeah, he, he loves the singing because yeah. he loves music. And, and yeah, I love the guy in his ear. He's like, yeah, so they're talking about how they want to kill Germans, right? That's what they're doing, you know? Right. You, you know, trying to yeah. to plant this seed in his head of something that that didn't happen. And it's combining the two sequences together. It actually reminded me of the um, the editing style we talked about briefly in our Manchur- Manchurian Candidate episode during the brainwashing um, oh, yeah. sequence. Yeah. Where it's like going into you have two, two spaces realities. and two rooms. Yeah. yeah. And and like sometimes they completely cross in the production design and in, you know, in, in the actual space. And the same yeah. thing kind of happens here. And sometimes it's used to really intentionally disorienting effect here, but in really cool ways. Yeah. It's a very, um, all the sets and locations and the way people are costumed is very precise so that the editing can pull over tricks on you. Because yeah. the way it works is to capture... Uh, Carell's frenzy scenes will kind of seamlessly bleed into the next in ways that mm-hmm. don't make sense per se. For example, yeah, you'll you, you know yeah, you'll, you'll be like people. completely yeah. yeah yeah yeah. There's a scene where because he's having uh, basically he's a married man and he goes off to this bordello basically and he sleeps with this one woman. And there's a scene where he goes into the bedroom in this other apartment where he sleeps with her, and the room has the same wallpaper as his bedroom at his house. So when Mm -hmm. there's a close-up of him looking at the wall, when they cut back, he's then in his bedroom with his family. And the movie's full of things and, like and that. And the actress who plays the prostitute is also the actress who plays his wife. Like, yes, they really yeah, just want to fuck with you. <laughs> and... 
you can tell it's all subjective too because there are cuts between scenes that are associations that only he would make. Like there's a yeah. bit where he's giving uh, a, a new hire at the crematorium who he later turns into the Nazis uh, a tour of it and he goes into the room where they keep all the ashes and the bottles. And it's this mm-hmm. really... It, it, the screen is basically black because just these white shelves and then it's these black bottles of ash mm-hmm. and it cuts from a close-up of one of those ashes to a bunch of blooming flowers. It's like, oh, of course, that's what Carell would associate it with. Yeah. Because he believes that as soon as you're burned, you know, you're going to ascend you're and reincarnated. You're reincarnated as the flowers. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I also I like uh, later on when that same guy tells him that he doesn't want to work so closely to the bodies anymore, and that that would, mm-hmm. and then he's like, yeah. that would be a demotion though, and he's just like, yeah, I'm completely okay right. with it. Like the, the smell yeah. and the bodies are just, it's not yeah. normal to me. <laughs> um, I yeah. also like the way he contradicts himself in in scenes, like at the beginning when he's hosting that that dinner party, he's telling people like mm-hmm. not to smoke and not to drink, and he, you know. T- you know, oh, he's, talks he, about, he's abstinent, of course. Right, right. right. Yeah. And talks about married life as if you should take it very seriously. And then meanwhile, he one of the things that convinces him, uh, for instance, to go to the Nazi party is when he just shows him all the cards of all the prostitutes that he can choose from when he goes to their their meetings. Exclusively uh, blonde and naked women. Yeah. Yes, yeah. And then that's when he's the number one the, thing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, absolutely. It, it seems like that's the thing that really pushes him to go to the meeting itself. And then you have that sequence where he's talking to his his uh, Nazi friend and, and he's looking across the dinner table and the guy is just, you know, he's, he's getting a blowjob from one of the girls mm-hmm. beneath the table and <laughs> being caressed from another yep, one. Yep. And he's just like, oh, OK, well, <laughs> this is pretty cool, I guess. Um, and it's yeah, just such a while- contradiction to what he says his character is. Because, yeah, he betrays himself because while yeah. the Nazi's talking, you're, what he's seeing is what you're seeing, and what he's seeing is the, the guy getting a blowjob. Right. And it's yeah, he, he, like, he, there's even a shot yeah. of him, like, POV, like, looking under the table. Yeah. Being like, oh, wow, that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And th- there's bits also, like, when he's going to check out new paintings for decor for his apartment, and his apartment, which he's very proud of, he's constantly talking about how clean his bathroom is. Yeah. Um, but he, loves he looks at these paintings and then they're all these like two, three frame cuts to other paintings he's looking at, which are just close ups of like naked breasts um, yeah. or bits where he's abstinent. But also he finds a way to justify drinking where he says, oh, I'll have a ceremonial glass of champagne. And then yes. the scene, there's a big scene where he's essentially it's horrific and he's just giving up everyone he knows who is Jewish, which at first starts as like people who he doesn't like. And yeah, then people who he annoy gets, him. Yeah. He has his coworkers a lot yeah. of the time. <laughs> and then he gets so like high off his own supply, starts naming everyone and eventually um, his family because his wife is half Jewish. But while he's doing that, he keeps going between drinking champagne noticing he's drinking champagne, then drinking water, then going back to drinking the champagne, like, automatically. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah, it's really also, an incredible performance by um, Rudolph, I, Rudolph Hrusinski, I believe. And he did comedy uh, before who, this, right? Which I guess comes with the whole, like, dark comedy of it, but it, it just... He's he's an absolute he, powerhouse. Yeah, he was he he was well yeah. known as a as a comedian at the time. Yeah, okay, yeah. Which makes yeah. it a you know a, a make makes some interesting casting mm-hmm. um, for this. And I mean, I I just love the the way that they they make him you know his his general sort of look and behavior. I love like the the combination of like this very round head and face and the really thin <laughs> slicked hair and how kind of like fancy lad he likes to walk <laughs> yeah, around and dress exactly. and. But meanwhile, uh, he's, he's like harassing he's always, the staff and and just doing absolutely yeah. horrendous things. Like another really uh, what? gross physical thing yeah. that he does throughout the entire movie is he has this little comb that he always combs his hair <laughs> yes. with. But he'll yeah. go from like combing the dead person's hair to combing his hair to combing his son's hair. It's to so, combing his child's yeah, hair. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. my God. It's so gross that he does yeah. it throughout. It's, it's he's Meanwhile, he's like, everyone enjoyed it. the pleasant, beautiful music and the refreshments. Uh-huh. And, you know, he's, he's very into beauty and art and wit and and religion and everything right. like this meanwhile yeah, he's obviously man. into one of you know his yeah. 
his his occupation is obviously very macabre. So, you know, there's one of my favorite moments early on is when he's at that fancy party that he's hosting and like he just starts talking about like how someone they know he thinks he has kidney problems or urine problems in front of his wife trying to like eat and she's just like, "Oh god, like why?" And she just stops eating and she's just like, "What? You don't like it?" And because he <laughs> associates you know, these sort of real earthly physical bodily you know, kind of horrors with something that is could be done in casual conversation and should be, you know, uh, that 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 doesn't sort of disturb the vibe. And I love how half the time he makes up for it by just being like, you know, he'll talk about something horrifying and then he'll be like, but you can choose the next like orchestral song that we put on (laughs) uh and he starts like name dropping (laughs) classical musicians like like patrick bateman talks about like phil collins or something i love also (laughs) when he thinks that his he's going and picking out like the the various paintings that he's looking at and he even like he pretends to like know what the painting is and he doesn't (laughs) they're like well the the writing says something different (laughs) yeah Yeah, he's he's definitely yeah. He, he's he's definitely on the pursuit of being a member of high society, which is something yeah. that the Nazis offer him. They yeah. they offer him a place at the high table if he you know uh, is is willing to um, you know create these uh, giant ovens. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting because we're talking about it here, and we agreed at the start of the conversation that it's it is you know a, a comedy, but it's not necessarily super funny. But now that we're talking about it, there are so many scenes and so many moments and bits that are ridiculous. They're ridiculous. ridiculous. There's a recurring gag of this guy and his wife and his wife is like very squeamish and they keep showing up whenever Carell and his friends and family go out. So there's a scene where they go to a wax museum where... It's just oh, showing man. all these what horrific murders where all the wax dummies are played by actors very right. clearly. You can see the eyes kind of dilate, which is very uncanny. But the, the this yeah, guy and, and his wife and, are and the tableaus out. are very expressionist. Like the the way yeah. that the circus looks, I I could have sworn that you know this was like uh like a, like a, you know the the circus in like freaks or something out of Doctor yeah. Caligari as yeah. he's like you know, uh, showing you just like the serial murder, graphic murder. And he's showing this to, you know, these friends and his wife and his kids. And he's like, come on, everyone, like, look at this. Like, and it's just such a contrast to how much joy he has in a scene like this or in the sequence where like he's talking about the process of turning human bodies into dust <laughs> with the the guy that he's showing around the crematorium and how passionate he is about this versus when he takes the family to the carnival he's completely expressionist while uh, expressionless while all the kids are like overjoyed on like the swings and watching mm-hmm. the acrobatic performances and the balloons and he's just like this is fucking nothing you know yeah. L- let's take them to the little carny murder show and <laughs> we'll watch something sick <laughs> yeah and he's having a blast and then the the guy who runs the show lets him in a room of like anatomical curiosities and they have a bunch yeah. of death masks of how people look when they have like syphilis and he like and gonorrhea and like yeah, aborted and Siamese fetuses and <laughs> he goes and he looks in the reflections and then does like goofy like mocking recreations of the expressions which is is yeah. horrifying but it's also ridiculous no it's and then they it's uh, yeah and, 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 and it speaks to the larger kind of fun house bending that we're watching take place here. Like his his mind is literally being twisted and stretched in the exact way that you would at a carnival fun house mirror. <laughs> One yeah. of the first shots we see is of actually, I think the first time we see him in full at the zoo is literally it's, it's in a in convex mirror. mirror. Right? Yeah. And then yeah. <laughs> we see a reverse shot, which is like from the mirror's perspective where they're straight. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So the whole movie again, it's very, very expressionist. It's probably one of the most like extreme examples of expressionism I can think of in a movie. Like every mm-hmm. shot, just wide angles up the wazoo. Like it, it's and really he, something. Yeah. They start it's to crazy. use the uh, that that kind of murder freak show exhibit and the 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 syphilis displays and all of that as images when he starts to they start to edit those quick images when he's even talking to his family like i think for like one time he's talking Mm -hmm. to his daughter and there's a a girl's face that pops up that's like half burnt off and it's only for a second too like if you look away you're gonna miss it um and it's just i love the way they they throw that in there to kind of just show his 
slow delusion and uh, descent into madness. It's just it's really horrifying. Yeah, I mean, the, the the visual style of it, I think, is really impeccable and very carefully, you know, um, considered in the way that it's been done. Like the sudden sort of like yeah. abstracted close up shots that create mm -hmm. kind of lines on on shots of faces and bodies the as if they've kind of been like too. cleaved off by the uh, frame. And there's like a distortion. Um, like like some, sometimes you're looking at a shot that's literally just like half of someone's face popping up at like the bottom right of a frame or something like mm -hmm. that with yeah. tons of negative space mm -hmm. or you know as jamie already mentioned and perry mentioned a little bit the very troubling sort of repetitive jarring split second cutting where we enter his mind briefly and sometimes it's as simple as like he's just exploring a room and a place to put his painting and we'll just watch <laughs> yeah. his thought process at play where it cuts to a bunch of different close-ups of different parts in the room where he's thinking about putting the painting and it, it's just really awesome how it kind of instructs you that that is subjectively what's happening in his mind which then really freaks you the fuck out when you know his his attention drifts uh to a woman on the other side of the room and he starts focusing on her and then the naked photos start coming up uh, or the the yeah. sudden jarring cuts to bugs or the sort of like the flesh eating face disease doll or um you know the 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 corpses as well and, and again his his sort of sexual impulse infiltrates his political one um right. at a certain point um it, which it, is you know part of why he's seeking power it's control over other people's um bodies both sexually and also as for part of this sort of liberatory process that he's talking about and it's just crazy that you get all of that through you know, twists of lenses and twists of cutting and, you know, especially the fluid sort of stream of consciousness mindset. sort of transitions. Yeah. 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 Like that stuff is just, you know, the way that that is all blended um, together is like really, really um, Im impeccably done. And that's before you even get into the like fisheye lens tracking shots and POV shots that we start getting in the finale where it's like straight up the camera is like directly in another character's face and it's like stretching it and things like that. It's yeah. just, it's, it's horrifying. Yeah. <laughs> and to add, I guess yeah. there, there is um, a sense of dark humor when they incorporate the music in specifically in the sun and I think mostly the daughter uh, murder, or I guess with the daughter, it's the attempt of murder. Um, they have a very like almost upbeat orchestral song that plays while he chases her throughout the crematory. Yeah, it's um, um for, I, I looked it up. It's it, it's like some sort of um Slovakian like waltz okay. from what I understand, like some sort of folk waltz or something like that. But you're right in that the sense that it feels like something that is, you know, kind of optimistic and something you can yeah. dance to in a kind of way, which is not the tone of the images. <laughs> no, because you just have a screaming daughter begging for her father for her life as he's trying to murder her and put her in a coffin to <laughs> alleviate the soul um and meanwhile you have this kind of yep. almost like i, I don't want to call it uh, temple music, of death yeah <laughs> yeah yeah that too <laughs> calls his workspace the temple <laughs> of death that's the first red flag to be honest and yeah well and, and shit the, the way and and the casualness with which he describes it too i actually thought yeah. it, you know the, the scene where he's w just walking the new assistant around i thought was one of the most interesting scenes in the film just because of you you get a view of what his routine is and what his his rituals are and yes they you know stem from you know some sort of misreading of kind of buddhism in a way but it's it's very interesting how he worships them like they are his own kind of religion in that way and there is he likes to watch you know, the, the way that he does Ooh. Yeah, yeah. In that tour, and he I, shows I just that there's the, an eye hole for. He's like, if you'd like to go into the yeah. furnace and take a look, <laughs> and he he does it with yeah, excitement. He's 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 so proud of it, and I love that he refers to it as um, it reminds me of the ovens that we bake our daily bread in, except yeah. you know, we're putting a body in there for seventy five minutes, and like that's such obviously a a terrifyingly casual way to describe it, but it you know that how is how it was historically applied, so it you know it it, it absolutely makes sense. Um, it's worth mentioning that the crematorium itself does look like a temple and it has these yeah. it two like those symmetrical -Roman, shots of it from the outside. Yeah. And there are these two like Greco Roman statues outside, like, um, uh, almost like the statues in the courtyard and something like, uh, uh, oh my God, how's the name sound escaping me? The Alan Renee movie last year, Mary in bed. Um, yes. it's oh, almost okay, like yeah. that. And they have these big torches on, which are like, uh, 
a Spartan detail. And so he's obsessed with when the Nazis bring up Sparta and how right. German culture idealized the Spartan culture. He's like, oh, it's like it's like the, the temple I love so much. And it's also worth mentioning because he's so obsessed with this idea of this alleviation of suffering is yeah. he learns yeah. that his wife is half Jewish, so his children are quarter Jewish, which means by Nazi law they're undesirable. And um, I'm I'm Jewish, and what this movie and char- the way this movie characterizes Judaism, and it's a movie by a Jew, is like it's a very solemn uh, religion that is very mm-hmm. attentive to suffering. And that's something that really disturbs the cremator in this. He's like, well, if all these Jews are suffering, then wouldn't the best thing to do be to alleviate right. their suffering by, by cremating right. them? Um, right. And that's like what allows him to justify murdering his family. And it's very upsetting when you watch him go out because like the last 20 minutes of the movie are him like he murders his wife and he murders his son he attempts to murder his daughter and he sees himself as like an angel for doing this like yeah. he's like yeah. oh I'm and ending his, I'm ending your suffering and historically it was um, like it, it's after the, the 13th Dalai Lama died too so I feel like he has this sense of like I'm going to replace him I'm going to be the next right. spiritual guide and yeah well, there, at, at, at the end, he hallucinates driving up to the palace. Right. And he yeah, right. thinks that af- to go, after to, to he, go assume yeah. his position, right? Yeah, yeah and it's exactly. after he's basically become one of the architects of the Holocaust. He gets in this house like, all right, I'm going to head up to the palace and take my place now that I've ceased suffering on Earth. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 And it, w- 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 what's really scary, I think, about the film is how gradual they make that that kind of twist of his idea i guess is that mm-hmm. you you the way of kind of watching this film is that you are dropped into this very compulsive obsessive headspace of this process based cremator and you know through the bouts of kind of subjectivity um, you do become kind of accustomed to uh, how he feels about his work. And on yeah. one level, you understand it as this is probably just the kind of thing you have to believe to do this work because it's scary work and it's, you know, it's, it's brutal work in that way. Yeah. And there's something to be said about how, you know, he's talking about these, you know, these uh, spiritual ideas to this new guy that he's, he's walking around the place and talking about, you know, how he's freeing these people from their suffering and from, you know, and cleansing them in, in a kind of way. And, um, you know, he even like opens up a coffin and he's like, look, she's, you know, she's so beautiful. She's rosy. She's almost alive. Isn't she? But you know, she's been pronounced dead and we're going to incinerate her. And the, the, the filmmaking doesn't let you escape from just the physical reality of what he is. He's doing it. There's never a break where it goes, you know, all of a sudden, the, the the girl has been reincarnated or something or there's some sort of sign right. of that there there right. really is just the texture of kind of like the uh you know the the wood going into the fire and the smoke coming out and everything like that like it really focuses visually on the physical act of doing that so right. on one hand you get the idea that to cope with that physical reality he has to believe this on some level but then you introduce the allure of of power and politics into that and you slowly watch it get co-opted by that and you know not very subtly is the thing that's really intriguing like we've already talked about how the you know the the nazi kind of makes pleas for him on a on a literal level and just slowly pushes him in each direction being like man wouldn't your life be easier if you were you know a real member of high society and you had a hot new blonde wife and (laughs) you know like the the actual bribes are very juvenile when you think about it but it's very funny when you're watching the film they don't really feel that way like in your you're in his mind where all of this kind of makes sense which i think does make it a little bit scarier by the time you get there you're seeing the logic that he's following yeah, even right. if well, you know the film is cueing you into how you know uh ridiculous and how uh twisted that is it's all very juvenile as you mentioned the the bribes to him and again it's because he's like a little boy i mean there's that scene where he's given up all his co-workers to the nazis 
and he watches them storm in and he waves at them and you watch slowly the wave turn into the the salute and, yeah, and he's got when this he face does like that he's you see it he, on. yeah and he yeah. gives this smile it's like the widest smile he gives in the movie where he's like oh that feels good doesn't yeah, it right. like he, it's all libidinal for him he's just he it just feels good for him he's having fun yeah and i and i yeah. think he's starting to see the the real like physical power that it's bringing to him as well um because just watching those five men run into the to the his little temple and uh and and take take his uh, assistant like yeah to to, 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 to go take away the people who have been annoying him and by annoying him they've just like you know rejected his creepy sexual advances at work (laughs) right like yeah (laughs) yeah and so it's the first time that he really sees that that power i think physically and not just it, it being talked about he's he's now there and he's in a position to uh to exercise it and as you mentioned that the physicality of it uh, of like death in it and the physicality of the actions and how they are visually represented as like coexisting with this ideology is very clear at the parts where he's actually murdering his family i mean if you want to talk about power there's the bit where he he hangs his wife and then he goes scene. to beat his son to death with a metal pipe. And in yep. both of those scenes, it's still in this like warped uh, expressionist perspective. And there's still a lot of fast cuts. But when the violence actually happens, it doesn't soften it. And the camera doesn't avert its eyes or anything. Like it's mm-hmm. really shocking no, it, and scary to if, play the violence. If anything, the camera intentionally opens up so you see yeah, more of it. A lot the, of the time yeah. that's when they switch to the the like wide angle lenses that are so wide they're practically like fisheye lenses. Yeah. And apparently this was like the first time these lenses were even used in, in country for one of their films. They had to get them shipped in because it was a very specific look that they wanted. Especially in the hanging when he, he pulls the stool out from under his wife and you just see I, I, love mean, I don't how even know how they did that. She yeah. is too yeah like the way that he just kind of like is you know just well, uh because it's how he sees it yeah you know, right. he's, he's seeing he, he it, sees as, it oh, as she's this accepting freeing. death like her yeah the kid too when he successfully kills his son the kid just has like a a blank look on his face says like says something like daddy don't or something but he still is just kind of standing there it's very yeah, the, even and the, there, there's these very brief uh, occasional flashes sometimes like that part where he like grabs his neck and the frame is very briefly just like his eyeball in the very like foreground yeah. of the frame almost in the lens and the entire room is kind of like the the background so there's there's a couple moments where it's like the f- physical horror of what is taking place is is expressed but it is interesting how it's being as Perry mentioned warped by this perspective yeah, it's like of diluted is, by him you know yeah yeah he, he is the one who, you know, despite the fact that he's become fully radicalized and at his wife's funeral, he's even basically like doing a Nazi party rant, essentially, while all yeah. of his like friends and neighbors leave and all of his new Nazi friends are like, hell yeah, man, keep yeah, up, do, this yeah. do it up. Yeah. And at the, her funeral, um, which is just, yeah. So fucked. The, the POV yeah. before the hanging too, where it's her kind of going throughout the, the house in every single room until they get to the bathroom. It feels as oh, if yeah, like she's just chasing her down almost. Yeah. And it feels as if the way she's acting, it, it, like she is scared and it gets progressively scarier, <laughs> but she's still not, you know, screaming or anything like that. So it feels as if you're getting enough information to know that, you know, she, he's leading her to her death. And this is kind of a violent thing that they're going through right now. But his delusions, I think, are kind of making it the diet version of that. So she's not entirely right. screaming. She's just kind of walking to the bathroom and she looks like worried and, you know, kind of like what's going to happen, but it's nothing that's completely horrifying. And I, I just feel like if we got the, the real version of that scene, it would be nothing but, you know, essentially her, her him yeah. forcing her into the bathroom and putting the noose around yeah. and, and all of that. Instead yeah, of it, it, would, it would be a house that Jack built uh, style yeah. sequence. Yes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It would be de- definitely a lot more disturbing in that way. But yeah, I, I, that's what I do find interesting is that, you know, technically he is showing you something horrifying, but he, you know, he's having his mind adjusted in ways to make it seem more like the spiritual thing that he's been referring to this process right. of um 
you know, cleansing and of liberation um, in that way, even when, you know, he's taking his son like into the coffin room and literally, you know, grabbing it on the other side of the room completely out of focus while the son is cleaning his glasses. And then by the time he puts his glasses back on, he's in front of him with this giant metal rod and just beats him over the head with it. And his blood is going down the drain like he's been in like a slaughterhouse. And it just hoses it down. like completely Hoses lack of emotion. Oh my God. I also find it interesting that in the very beginning of the movie, he finds that rod or the assistant does, and he tells him to just mm-hmm. keep it because he might need it. And and it's before all yeah. of these, cri- this madness kind of takes into place. So it, it seems Chekhov's, as if it was there. Uh, metal rod, <laughs> crematorium metal rod. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It seems it's as coming if the back. thoughts were there. <laughs> um, it's, it's just that he needed, you know, he needed an excuse to exercise those thoughts, I guess. And he found it. And really, I mean, just talking about and talking about this friction that the movie works with, where we're locked in this Mm -hmm. guy's perspective and he's doing these awful things. But the movie is also, while locked in his perspective, is still displaying them in a way that's obviously monstrous. Like, it's the hardest balancing act a director can manage. Yeah. Like, that's so tricky to pull off and not just go one way or the other. I mean, just... I have no idea how anyone can make a movie like this, really. It's <laughs> yeah. incredible. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, I'm, I'm right there with you because I, I, I think it does a really good job in the last sequence where he, he um, tries to murder the daughter in the exact same way that he murders the son. And uh, she ends up kind of realizing faster than the son. And, you know, he ends up having to like full on like horror movie style chase her around the coffin room with the pipe. And, you know, the the wide angle stuff gets really crazy as they're literally there's a full chase and tracking maneuvers going through these various coffins that they're, you know, she's trying to run away with him from. And then he gets so distracted by his, uh, you know, sort of like his spiritual quest this transformation yeah. that he's made that he actually loses track of her and he sees himself and you know himself you know in the, the sort monk. of like buddhist garb as and, the dalai lama yeah, yeah. And, and and telling him you know about what what he's achieved and what he's going to become and one of my favorite things that speaks to what you were just mentioning perry that you know it it, it does both without sacrificing one is that you get this full-on hallucination of himself as a monk as the dalai lama telling you <laughs> Uh, that he's having a full-on conversation with but and it's in this amazing you know sort of wide angle lens shot where it's clearly from his eyes and his monk self is like you know sort of bowing right in front of him (laughs) in that same shot you get the daughter running away in the background yeah yeah because she actually has like kind of escaped yeah, so yeah. so you get something that is full on hallucinatory, but also keeping that you know the realist, the actual thing that's physically happening in the scene. His daughter is screaming and running away because she thinks she's about to be murdered. Yeah, um, there's such so a, the fact that you could put both of those things in a single shot like that, like it does in that sequence, is amazing. There's also such a terrifying thought of just the line of dialogue when the the one Nazi coordinator comes up to him and he mentions the daughter and he says. Don't worry about it. We'll see. We'll see to it. Like there's no there's no worries yeah, you, anymore. You, you have you have you have, have bigger plans. Yeah, you have bigger <laughs> plans, and it also uh, hints that the that the Nazis have completely occupied this space now. They have the power to do yeah. so. So that he's not even needed to take out his individual family. Uh, we can take care of that now. The state can take care of that. You're just going to make yeah. the genocidal machine. <laughs> It's just wild. Yeah, that, so that, that you sequence that too, up, when, yeah. when they pitch him on the machinery, oh, is man. fucked. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's the, the, the big scene of the movie. Well, before I talk about that, I want to say real quick, something you yeah. just brought up. Um, you never see the Nazi occupation of Czechoslovakia. Like, you never right, sure. see tanks rolling in. And the only ways you can tell that time has passed in the movie is a character will mention, oh, I've been working this job for 10 years. And later they'll say, oh, 12 years. Or mm-hmm. characters will mention, we're going off to war, and later they'll mention, well, now that the Nazis are in charge, so-and-so. Because he has this myopic focus on his job yes. that World yeah. War II for him may not even exist. Like, it's just other shit going on while he's working the crematorium. He doesn't care at all. I th- so Yeah, I think that's what another at, at great— At the end, yeah. It's another great way of separating that critique of, you know, the, the subjectivity and the real history here. Um, just because that is a like it's a that it, right there is a great example of it being completely subjective in in his own space because he's not even really conceptualizing that this 
that the Nazi party has has taken over the state. He's really more focused on his own power and, I guess, transcendence or whatever he wants to call it. Well, and 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 these people who are pitching to him this idea of what if we spread your philosophy yeah. around the world? Your good faith. Yeah. And, you know, like that is really alluring to him. Right. Exactly. You know? Right. Yeah. Cause he he pitches a design for ovens that can incinerate people quickly is basically what he does. Yeah, the greatest um, possible number of souls at once is how yeah. he how he and says it. Free them from the fetters of, of earthly existence <laughs> and dissolve them into the ether. It is a tremendous opportunity, is how he is describing <laughs> the, the the conception world. of, you know, uh, this yeah. this mass murder and tool. He's giving it he's giving this speech um in front of this giant Bosch painting. Which yes, the hieronymous uh, yeah. Bosch paintings that depict like tortures and executions yeah, and religious temp- suffering yeah. and afterlife. It cuts to like it, close-ups of the little like beasts and ghouls and the Temptation of Saint Anthony painting while he's talking. Yeah, and it's just like you're and, in and hell the way that the camera scene, tilts really into the awful. reflection. Yeah. The way that the camera is on him with the painting in the back and then tilts down into his reflection on the table where oh, then yeah. there are superimposed images of his neighbors and his Jewish friends and his family like all falling into these horrifying images, yeah, like painting images like, like a pit. Paintings. Yeah. Yeah. That stuff is like and he goes, unbelievable. He goes so far that even it looks like that Nazi coordinator is like, hey, like. Get it together. What the <laughs> hell are relax. you doing? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, um, right, because it, I mean, this guy doesn't, doesn't care about uh, saving souls or something. He has no yeah. idea what the cremator is talking about. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He's just like, he, he knows exactly what they're doing and he wants to keep it a secret. Whereas the cremator, you know, he sees it as this faithful exercise, this thing that he can alleviate souls and, and transcend everyone. So it's, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's a perfect merging of someone's own... Um, again, subjective philosophical or ideological um, ideas and then mixing them with, you know, this sort of political machinery that is, you know, so you so you you get these two things completely interwoven in that scene where they are like, yeah, your vision of the world suits our political goals in this moment. So let's collaborate on something. Yeah. Yeah. and yeah, when in, in that moment, when and obviously, you know, you can put two and two together, like what it is that he is about to become the head architect of, you know, one of the you know most insane mass murder devices basically ever conceived. And the craziest part is, once again, you know how he got there, yeah. you know, like you 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 totally uh, you totally see how his mind was, you know, his mind. I wouldn't say it was in the least warped place when it started. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's hints right but it, away. it is it is incredibly intriguing to me how few tweaks to his ideology it takes um yep. to get him to the place where like you know uh you know he can view uh the act that he's about to commit as something that's sort of pure and holy and and enlightened uh despite the fact that obviously you know we know that it's horrifying um and the movie again doesn't doesn't pretend that it's not horrifying either, which is that tricky balancing act that it plays. You know, you're, you're, you're never not unsettled by the thing that he's doing in this movie. Even when he is just doing his job of burning bodies for funeral reasons, you're like, that seems wrong. Yeah. Or at least the way that he's he's romantically involved with it seems wrong. Yeah. Yeah, (laughs) definitely. But yeah, this movie is incredible. Um, and I was got to say, I was really, really blown away by that. Just that that final the hysterical moment of he has transformed into this religious figure and assumed his position as the architect of these ovens. And, you know, he's the wide angle shots of him in the back of the car, leaving the girl behind as he's being driven towards the Patola Palace in Tibet and everything like that. Just and and what is it what is it what are the lines that he gets he's like the nation awaits all of humankind haven't saved yeah. uh, them yet haven't rescued yet but don't worry we'll you know we'll no one shall suffer i shall save right. them all yeah. Yeah. the whole world because what he what he believes essentially is complete global extinction yeah he wants to burn everyone in the world it's the only and way he, to alleviate the suffering yeah, yeah. And yeah, it's 
really hysterical is the word for it. I mean, the the la- the whole movie, but especially those last 20 minutes are like, they're from another planet. It's impossible to communicate just how intense this movie is and how um, aggressively it moves in words. Like, you have to see it, basically. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, our, our words definitely can't do uh, it justice in, you know, how it feels to actually like experience this thing in motion, especially again, some of the, the visual techniques and some of the editing techniques, like some of them are very sudden and jarring. And some of them are these more sort of um, f- f- sort of fluid um, uh, sort of construction dynamics to it as well. And yeah, the way that all of it is used to just get you into this um, um headspace it is it, it it really is like insane and if we're pivoting towards the reductive rating round for me this one was a pretty easy five um i i found this in, intensely um disorienting and and gruesome and i'm i guess after talking about it i will say funny but in like ways that are only bleak and disturbing and you kind of think about <laughs> in retrospect just it. how ridiculous yeah. and absurd the sort of events that take place are but the, the very gradual expressionist yeah yeah but that's it it's the very gradual expressionist descent quality that you know he's taken a little bit visually from the silent era he's taken taken a couple sort of lurid genre elements that from 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 hitchcock which he said that he was a huge fan of and and a little bit of the louis bunuel uh surrealism in there well um as well and I just found this sort of the way that he mixes all of those things into this kind of like grotesque funhouse stretching of this character's psyche and then merging that with this violent historical backdrop that you kind of bring your own knowledge of to it. Um, I found that incredibly um Effective, And then as Jamie put it, like the, the sort of like d- disorienting or I guess contradictory kind of like waltz like yeah. score that's kind of playing over the um, entire thing and all of the strange use of, of lenses and, and camera moves. And I, all of it, I think, was just really effective and essentially you are watching a concentration camp survivor rework you know, these sort of wide angle POV subjectivity that we've talked about a lot on this show um, and uh, sort of trace back to things like Peeping Tom. And uh, yeah, you're 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 watching this guy gradually bend his own sort of spiritual philosophical ideas and bend them into a literal arm of of a genocidal machine. And uh, while also thinking that he's the next Buddha, uh, (laughs) which is just uh, an element that I, you know, found very uh, strange and somehow it totally works. And uh, yeah, I just found how unbearable this headspace was and how swept up you get into it and how close you are to it. Just really skin crawling Um, and uh, a very solid depiction of how someone can delude themselves into thinking that, you know they are doing something pure and spiritual uh, despite the fact that uh, they are, you know, doing one of the most evil things the world has ever seen. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. <laughs> Perry, I'm going to let you go first. Cause I'm still wrestling with the, the four or five. Jamie's on the edge. Yeah. yeah. I'm on the edge, yeah. baby. So. Um, I mean, it's another easy five for me. Uh, I first saw this movie last year and it just blew me away. And I thought it was the scariest thing in the world, which it is. And then when I rewatched it for the podcast, that's when this whole new angle unlocked me. I was like, wait, when he described it, when the director described it as a dark comedy, because in interviews, Jiraj Hers um, basically exclusively refers to it as a comedy. And so interesting. That really opens up on the second watch, which makes the horror even more uneasy because they exist in this awful friction which i mean that's what the whole movie is it's truth and fiction and comedy and horror and it's political and spiritual and i mean it's i it's everything i could want so i'm yeah Yeah. it's five yeah i uh i'm idea of a perfect movie i would say um i i I think i'm leaning towards the five as well the the first uh the first time i watched it i actually didn't even know that it was about uh, 
uh, the Nazi occupation or anything like that. I, I just do it was about a cremator who had some some strange spiritual beliefs. Uh, it, so because I just <laughs> I didn't look into it. I didn't read anything about it. Um, so when it started to take that turn, <laughs> it was very, very surprising to me. And um, and I think the second time around, I could really lock into his headspace in the first 30 minutes, um, connecting it to all the all the, the Nazi ideology and, and how he would be able to use genocide as a way to alleviate suffering and, and all of that crazy nonsense. Because y- you do realize the second time watching it, the first 30 minutes even has it's full of delusions just the just the same way that it is in the second half of the film it's just that i guess um when you don't know what's coming they're just more innocent delusions yeah, right exactly. they're just like you know exactly and then quickly you realize that these innocent delusions given the right power structure can can be just absolutely can be horrendous. co-opted <laughs> yes yes and, yeah. and it's it, it's uh it's a terrifying thought and so even uh, you know i i do see a little bit of you know, comedic tone here, obviously, but I, I still, even on that second watch, I, I found it completely horrifying and maybe even more so. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's I, a, a harm percent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, lo- I love the, I love that you're constantly in his headspace. Um, you, you basically just get like a waterfall of information that's of what's going through his mind. Uh, and I, I thought that was great. And, and it really leads to some interesting contradictions because he often says things that, aren't being acted upon on screen. Um, I love the way that every scene flows into the other in ways that makes you kind of disoriented at first. Like who is he? He'll be talking to somebody and then the end sentence that he says will be to somebody else as the the scene transfers. Oh yeah. We didn't even mention all those shots of him, like basically talking into the camera before you even know who he's talking to. Right. And you think that it's directly to you basically. (laughs) You almost think like he's relaying information to you, the audience. And then you'll realize he's talking to also his an wife uncomfortable device. Or a, yeah, definitely. Especially from this guy. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, there's, there's a lot here to, to unpack. Um, definitely check it out. I think it's on the criterion channel. So if you have a subscription, it is there. Um, yeah, yep. I, I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to five it too. I just, I want to retackle this thing again. Cause it's, it, there's just, it's definitely so a much lot to, to take on. in on a, on a single viewing. I, I definitely found myself sometimes, um, actually going back and rewatching scenes yeah, yeah. <laughs> because, well, because, the, because yeah. there were parts where I was like, am I supposed to be confused right now? Or, and I was like, yes, okay, I am. <laughs> yeah. And his, it's, his it's constant a rich flow of information made me, especially the first time around, it was difficult to take notes. Cause I'd be like, God, I'm really trying to get on this guy's level here, but he just keeps going about his, you know, crazy spiritual beliefs and, and political beliefs and whatever. So um, but yeah, it, it's it's fantastic. I, I think uh, yeah, gonna fly yeah. It. It, there's a, there's definitely <laughs> just this this really sort of intense kind of slippery psychology to it that it just yeah, really gets way. into. Yeah. yeah, and like you two talking about needing to rewatch it. That's one of the things about this movie that makes it an easy five. Makes one of my favorite movies is it's like I don't know, like Night of the Hunter or Sonatine or yeah. Tetsuo or something where I watch it and I just think, oh. I could watch this for the rest of my life and find new things. Yeah. 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 A hundred percent. Yeah. There's definitely a, a, a lot to take in here. Yeah. It's potent. But yeah. Oh, also <laughs> I, sure. I wanted to, I, I want to also look up if there's any, uh, and I think there are, I just don't know about them. Any historical ties between, uh, the Nazis, uh, and, um, the Tibetan Buddhism, because I do believe that the Nazis were very interested, probably in the yes. thoughts of like reincarnation and stuff. I imagine it's more power based uh, than the actual religion is. So, uh, but uh, I, I wanted so to look into that too. Germans, uh, they thought that Aryans came from Tibet. Okay. Okay. Uh, they thought that Aryans lived in the Himalayas, uh, in a, in a lost city, basically in Shambhala. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, I read so yeah, like that. Yeah. Yeah, it's one of those like Nazi occultism, uh, right? Strange things, for lack of a better word, very strange things. Yeah, uh, that was hmm. going on there. All right, well, I think that that is going to wrap it up for the cremator. We're going to be right back, and we're going to be talking about Workmeister Harmonies, or is it Werkmeister? I mean, I, I, I guess it's ger- it's, a, it's a German name, but it's a Hungarian film, so that's the part that's throwing me off. I think it's Werkmeister. 
<laughs> Either way, we're going to be back talking about some Bellatar. Right, we are back, and we are talking Workmeister Harmonies, the uh, 2000 Hungarian art drama mystery film, it is labeled here, directed <laughs> by one Bella Tarr, and also, I'm reading here, one Agnes uh, Horanzinski, or yeah. Horanitsky? Uh, he directs his movies with his wife. Interesting, Okay. Well, both of those, uh, so this is directed by them, and it's also based on a novel from 1989 called The Melancholy of Resistance. Now, Perry, you just practiced it. Oh, boy. By... Yeah. Um, Laszlo <laughs> Krajnakoy, I that was believe. good. Krajnakoy? Yep. I don't know. I'm not I think that sounds good. Sure, one. That was good. All right, yeah. Um, <laughs> um now this is this is a really um, this is a film and a filmmaker I didn't think that we would cover on the show because Bellatar <laughs> has a bit of a reputation. He is known as a kind of uh, you know Perry. Correct me if I'm wrong here. Is he known as kind of like a slow cinema festival He's director? He's known as outside of like Siming Liang. Probably he's like the big slow cinema guy. Um, yes. I, I assume that Saint Tango is the banner child of. Slow cinema. Slow movies. cinema. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, because um, he 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 has very few cuts in his films. He does very sort of languid um, long takes that average. Uh, I, I think I looked it up at one point, and it's like in his films, the average shot length uh, is something like between three and four minutes long. Yeah, which a- when you which awesome. when you apply that to like any kind of American film, yeah. uh, it's ridiculous. Where like uh, the av- the average cutting. I mean, if you look at an American action film, it's probably closer to like three seconds. Eight per, and three per baby. shot. Um, yeah, and if you and if you look at you know probably your standard one, I bet you it's probably somewhere between you know fifteen and thirty seconds. Yeah. Well, Verkmeister Harmonies has less shots than most scenes do. In most American movies, I mean, *Dark <laughs> yeah. Knight* has less than forty shots in two hours and twenty minutes. Yeah, and despite that, I actually found this honestly a pretty riveting oh, watch. Yeah. I think I think people kind of have a bad or a sort of a you know a misguided vision when they hear the name Bellatar and they hear the name Saint and Tango and they kind of they conjure an idea of a movie in their head that is like you know, a three hour or however, has, what's Sing Tango? Is it seven? A uh, seven, seven and hour. And a yeah. <laughs> uh, like kind of mundane, social realist documentary style. You just sit there at a table. <laughs> the entire movie is like Gene Dealman style. Someone, uh, baking a potato, you yeah, know? Yeah. Or I guess not baking a potato because it's too cold and yeah. in no, the in the, in the turn winters, horse they're boiling potatoes. There you go. <laughs> yeah, I gotta say, like um, he was always kind of intimidating for me. This is my first Bellatar. Um and I, I that's exactly what I anticipated, just really having to to sit into it and and, and really kind of force myself to pay attention. But I was completely enthralled by this, like yeah. from start to finish. I just thought I was I was locked in in all of the sadness <laughs> and the cold. It was uh, it's great. Yeah, well, the, yeah I the thought thing- this film was 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 wonderful. But maybe Perry, since you know this is you know Jamie and I's kind of first stab at Bellatar, mm-hmm. maybe you can let us know what was what was going on in Bellatar's world. I read up briefly that you know he was born in Pech, but he he moved to Budapest, and he was you know at a very young mm-hmm. age he was kind of shooting documentaries about Hungarian street life and like working people and definitely working in that kind of, uh, the cinema verite, the, you know, the uh, neo realist yeah, kind of, uh, there was, style um, was where he got started. But this film is not that like at all. <laughs> yeah. There was this thing called the Budapest school, um, which is like, it's all about absolute social realism. Uh, and that's what he started in. And then he made this movie called Almanac of Autumn, 
which admittedly I haven't seen, but that's like a colorful like family drama. And then he interesting started collaborating with uh, Lajlo uh, Krajakoy, who writes very strange postmodernist apocalyptic fiction, basically. Um, I'm very intrigued uh, by this specifically. Would it, it, how have you read the book? I haven't read this book, but I've read Satan Tango. Um, okay. And okay. Satan Tango, the film is a puritanically faithful adaptation of the book. Uh, the book is this very strange dystopian novel set in like ambiguous time period Hungary where. Uh, basically there's this commune farm that gets tempted by a man who may or may not be the devil who ruins all their lives. Um, and from what I understand of the book, the melancholy resistance, which there's an adaptation of is Rook Charmides is only like a partial adaptation of the novel or an adaptation of like a second or a, a segment of the novel. But I, I haven't read it yet, so I hmm. can't speak with any authority. But what I can say is that uh, Krasnikov's ideas and sort of blend of existentialism and mysticism, although neither Krasnikov or Belatar would like me to uh, say it's mystic. They usually push back against that pretty hard in interviews. But it is. They, they have sort of supernatural ideas that appear in their collaborations, which they've worked together on everything since the movie Damnation, which is like mm. a noir mystery film. They made Saint and Tango, which of course is an adaptation of the book. It's like a, a weird apocalyptic drama dealing with the devil and dealing with, you know, abandonment by God, basically. Uh, there's mm. The Turin Horse, which is an apocalyptic film about... Uh, so Friedrich Nietzsche famously uh, had a mental breakdown when he saw a man whipping a horse in Turin. This is a movie about what happened to that horse and this family that owns the, the horse standing around while basically the world is unwritten and things start disappearing from existence, and someone reads a book that Bellator calls the Anti-Bible. And then there's The Man from London, which is like a spy film. So, despite his reputation, he makes movies that are a lot odder than what you'd get out of the Budapest school. They're fully, right. like, narrative uh, fables, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, well, I, I, I found that aspect really... Um, intriguing because, you know, reading up on his style in particular, especially when he got started, you know, you know, he, he had those, uh, social realist, um, elements to him where again, you know, it, it, it just this more sort of like mundane, unsensationalized storytelling dramas of kind of real people frequently deploying documentary style techniques and real locations and streets and apartments, and sometimes even non-actors to kind of get this, you know, this kind of truth as they, as they viewed it. And what was really intriguing to me was that I can see why Tar would want to push back on the mysticism element only in the sense that he kept some of the social realist elements, I think, in subject matter and in, I guess, kind of like the sparseness of the production design. And what's interesting is just that instead of with the style, instead of going documentary mode, he goes full on, you know, like dreamy, meditative subjectivity. The camera floats and it cranes and it tracks and it had to have taken an insane amount of construction and rehearsal to pull it off. But instead of doing it in this way that it feels like it's calling attention to itself or it is doing it in this sort of like almost action style uh, yeah. impressiveness. It's used to capture this very slow, this very hunched over kind of sense of resignation and, and observation. Um, I would that forget he's doing it central characters. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it's a really in incredible piece of, you know, craft and showmanship, but also restraint. Yeah. yeah. And I wanted 
I guess to I, I'm going to have to go back and go through and see like where this started to kind of creep up. It, I mean, maybe it started with his collaborations of Laszlo when he started um, sort of shifting the, uh, you know, some of the ideas of, you know, I, I guess you would call it mood or sort of the the use of symbols and stuff like this, like the whale in, in this in particular. And obviously you were talking about this horse as well. Like it seems like he he wants to drop you into in the case of this film sort of similar to Satan Tango, it sounds like, based on what Perry was talking about. He drops you into this um, this nameless, kind of anonymous Hungarian village, and he uses it as, you know, sort of unlike how the cremator, you know, very much wanted you to draw connections to this real historical um, sort of political backdrop. This one almost wants to create something more universally expressive yeah. in that kind of way. And and not in the way that's kind of like annoying, like when filmmakers talk about how, you know, this movie's for everybody. Like I think huh. he literally wants to use this setting and this lived reality of this Eastern European lifestyle who have gone through, you know, uh, systems that have gone wrong and, you know, massive wars. And in the case of these people, like very impoverished conditions where they are stuck in the dead of winter without heat and they don't have food. But he wants to use that to capture this almost this act genuinely, you know, unlike the character from the last film, this actually genuinely spiritual and kind of cosmic, um, you know, story that's taking place um, within that. Like, it, it, it's interesting. It, it feels like he has the social realist locations. He has the people. He has the conditions. But the style gives you something completely different. And, and that's where I get where Perry's coming in when he talks about the, the mystical element, because this this, you know, it, it feels this film does feel kind of dystopian and apocalyptic and timeless um, in a yeah. in a, a you know, a, a way that it, you know, might seem hard to pick up on when you're, you know, uh, you know, just watching the the early scenes and you're like, okay, this guy's been cleaning his bathroom for like right. two minutes. What the fuck is going on, you know? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. What's interesting about it is, first I want to say, dreamlike is a really good way to put it because like the cremator, Bellatar here is using the language of expressionism, but while Hertz sort of supercharged it, uh, Bellatar is kind of bring it down to its basic elements and abstracting it into just like shadows and darkness and coldness basically mm -hmm. and you're just going through these places that are real but the way he films them is like a dream of a real place rather than a real place yeah. if that makes sense it's very anonymous yeah, no, and it's very um, abstracted even like I mean, to attack it from another direction, both of these movies are about uh, the rise of totalitarianism in Europe. But while The Cremator gives you a specific time and place and ideologies to graph that to, Verkmeister Harmonies does it in the opposite way, where there's no easily identifiable ideology or place beyond the fact of, like, basic tenets of totalitarianism and populism. Mm -hmm. yeah. He's going in the opposite direction as the creator with a lot of the same visual and narrative ideas. Yeah, I mean, like, the, the way that you were describing the way that he uses sort of real scenes or real places and it makes them feel, you know, like like unreal or feel like you're, you're in a dream scene. I, I think about, you know, the, the very opening scene of this film which is a mm -hmm. mini short film in and of itself and is incredible. And it's literally like these sort of uh, patrons of a bar waking up in this drunken stupor and having this, um, this uh, main character uh, here of uh, Janos. And he is basically deciding that he is going to tell uh, as closing time hits and they're all being kicked out, that he is going to tell them kind of like one last story to take them all home. And he talks about this, um, 
he he basically gives them the story of the Earth's relationship to uh, solar eclipses and talks about an infinite emptiness and an impenetrable darkness. And he does a demonstration by literally like picking up drunken patrons. And it's kind of funny and making one spin around. He's like, you're the Earth and like you're the moon. And but the the mundanity of like what it is that this guy is literally doing is abstracted by the way that the camera sometimes pushes into close-ups on their faces or pulls out and all of a sudden like hits the ceiling where then like the light fixtures are taking up like half the frame as you know they're as he's talking about the idea of waiting for light and the sort of melancholy sort of piano melody that recurs throughout the film the the motif that plays which is really beautiful oh, so good. um starts kicking in yeah. and stuff like that and yeah i mean this the story sets the tone for the entire film this idea that you know uh as the you know various planets and the moon and everything is going around the earth that there hits a point where you know nothing but coldness hits you nothing but darkness hits you and you just kind of have to experience that and eventually you know hopefully at, at a certain point it rotates around and it's gone but it's setting you up for this idea that these characters in this particular time, in this particular place, which again is, you know, uh, he, he doesn't let you in on exactly when or where so that you can kind of be like, yeah, we don't know when this is going to end. Hopefully soon for these people, you right. hope by the end of the film that these experiences are, uh, <laughs> going to be over soon. But, um, there's this, I think quality to it where, you know, he's telling you this, this fable about darkness and then he goes out into the street and the framing is a camera pulling away from him so that like 95% of the frame is pitch black. And all you see is like the single street lamp and him. And like, so here is a guy who is like, yeah, yeah, he's he, he he's trying Walking to comfort people with this story of of the darkness is ending, but they are currently living in that darkness. And the darkness, Bellatar yeah. uses the camera at every given moment to um, express that to you that the this is where the characters currently live, um, and it's brutal. Yeah, yeah. and even and like the, the the very first shot where it's just uh, um, coal in a furnace to try to warm the place up and then you know it, it disappears yeah and then right when it shows the bar you know it's completely empty they're all just hammered guys that i assume just got off work and it's probably six hours from that now so they're all drunk as hell but it showed the mundanity <laughs> of of their existence and their isolation because it's it's like probably 12 guys in the small bar um, they aren't really talking to one another. It really does seem like it's the lead that makes them kind of interact in that moment and at least entertain them for a small amount of time. Um, but just the thought that that's what is their entertainment is, is something to consider where it's, it, they're just so isolated and there's really nothing in the town that this, uh, this, this little story at the bar is something of, of excitement in, in some way. I think that well, that's and that's cool too. that's another thing that adds to the dreaminess and fable like quality of it is yeah the way people act in the film and what they do is almost like a literalized version of their emotional states rather right. than yeah. what people normally do like the people who are feeling you know like torpid and slow and just kind of stuck are they show it they're just yep. like mannequins almost and there are bits where uh there's a scene much later on where there's a riot and then characters mm-hmm. see something that makes them realize regret and it's like this whole crowd suddenly takes on the characteristics of these two people that right. yeah. witness the the thing that makes them regret and the way everyone acts in the movie is just like they're um they're like ciphers for these emotions more than yeah and i think they're they're the characters in a fairy tale yeah yeah because like they 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 have emotional reverberation through crowds and certain characters are uh, almost allowed to act more realistic like for example janos and his uncle georgie are a bit more of what we think of when we think of right how characters usually act in movies and other people yeah. are they, they they act and they move and 
they're motivated in very strange ways. Yeah, like for instance, when mm-hmm. the uh, the the whale is being um, it's it's being dragged to the middle of the courtyard, and all we right. see is the lead walking through these like groups of men, and they're not interacting with one another. They're just huddled up in a group as if it's their friendship circle, but they're not. You know, they're not interacting. They're not talking about right. what's about to happen. It just seems like they're going through the motions, almost like zombie-like in a sense. Um, right. And and that just and I think that emphasizes the moment too, where the lead sees the the giant crate open up, and then we get that you know absolutely magical uh, uh, following of him going around the whale and looking into the eye. I think it just emphasizes that right. moment for him because he's surrounded by just such loneliness and isolation and and coldness and and just a lack of real human connection at all too uh, right. besides maybe and, his well, uncle and that's, and that's something else about this sort of dreamlike quality and what ultimately made me feel justified in bringing this on a genre film podcast is this element <laughs> of the whale and this sort of horrific absurdity where basically this town is languishing uh, everyone's miserable. The conditions are really bad. Uh, electricity is going out. People are, uh, the townsfolk yeah. are fearful and hostile. Yeah. There's lots of tra- talk of family tragedy and diseases yeah. Yeah. and it's, graveyards. It, and they're afraid to go out at night for fear of stabbing yeah. and assaults. And it, it's just all fun. Time. Yeah. But, but then there's a circus coming to town and what the circus is, everyone starts talking disdainfully like, Oh, I can't believe that circus is coming in and I can't believe they're laying the prince in and the prince uh, someone says is almost they describe almost like a demon as like this three eyed yeah. person who comes in and makes awful speeches. And then what the circus is, a giant truck comes into the town and the circus is only it's literally exhibit. just a giant yeah. sheet metal truck. It's with just the- a giant <laughs> truck with a whale in it. And it's just yeah, cause people, that, that, that shot yeah. of it riding into town, I thought was unbelievable. Just, yeah. just the, the, yeah, the, the the nighttime shot yeah. of like Janos like walking around at night, and you just get this, you know, I, the, like the the way that the light hits the buildings in these very mm-hmm. kind of austere frames. You get the cobble lit up by the headlights as the truck slowly approaches in this long shot of what you think is like an establishing shot of the truck like coming towards the camera. I thought it was just and a then by the time it first. hits the <laughs> yeah, like and then you get Janos anyway. like actually. You get Janos actually abstracted in this dirty over the shoulder shot of him watching it ride past him. And then you think that the shot is over then and it's not. The truck keeps driving away and he actually follows it and pans and basically watches it go down the entire other side of the street. So you're you're introduced to it in this very like mundane, creepy um, kind of style and then he you see the stick on poster on the telephone pole where it's yeah. like fantastic worlds largest giant whale and other wonders of nature is coming to town um, but it, it it doesn't feel like that you're literally just watch a giant sheet metal truck drive right. by a guy for like four minutes but I, will say, <laughs> and, I yeah, think again, that Janos has some real intrigue in it though because of its massive size he does feel like something oh for sure oh yeah is oh coming. yeah um, but yeah, well, it's, it's, yeah, it's this awful symbol. It's like this, it's clearly malignant, just this evil truck driving by. And there's this great shot where he's standing and watching the truck go by. And it's like the frame is, you see the shoulders and head of Janos in the right hand corner, lower right hand corner. And then the rest of the frame is just like moving sheet metal of this truck going yes. by. And you hear this awful cacophony. And it's clear, again, by going through this dream logic, that whatever this circus is, it's evil. You can just tell from as soon as you see this truck going by, like, oh, this is bad news. Um, and, well, and, and, and the entire townsfolk talk about it like there is this, you know, there is this dark cloud that follows it from town right. to town. And, and it, it destroys every town that it goes to. Right. And but I, but I think Jamie's point is interesting, too, which is that, like, that's absolutely the vibe. But Janos is also definitely when he, especially in the sequence where he, you know, we actually do see him sort of track around this stinky carcass and the the beautiful shadows and silhouettes. He's in awe of the size. It's beautiful and horrible at the same time. And you just see um, he is very intrigued. The way that he describes it is that it has this almost like pure godlike 
uh, you know, sort of uh, mystique to it, where he saw this gigantic animal that our mysterious Lord can create. And he actually insists that like his uncle should go and check it out. You know, like it's like, it's, it's really amazing. I've never seen anything um, like it. It actually does carry a little bit of uh, wonder for him, which is really depressing because you look at it and you're like, it's the the giant stuffed carcass of, of, of a whale. For him, it's disgusting. For For him, seeing the whale is like, it confirms the existence of God because all right. these people mm-hmm. in this town, they've only lived in this town. The ocean's not near them. And Janus walks around and sees this whale at the circus, which again, the only thing at this circus is the whale set up in like the plaza. Yes. Um, and he goes in and town he tells square someone, with a giant whale yeah. corpse in the middle of it. <laughs> he tells Incredible someone, image. Yeah. And he says, how mysterious is the Lord that he amuses himself with such strange creatures. Yeah. <laughs> Like, I oh, think, uh, something like a whale must be it must mean that God exists up there and is having fun. Yeah, I think the 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 wonder of, of the whale for him is really significant because, like we said, we've seen this guy live a very mundane and isolated, lonely, cold, empty life. Um, and <laughs> this thing, although, you know, it leads to some really destructive things throughout the society. For him, it's, I think, like a break from that. It's something to look upon and think there's something bigger out there. Uh, and it, it, I don't know if it's something for him to necessarily get motivation to look forward to something, but it does feel as if he has taken in something that he hasn't before, and that's very meaningful to him, um, which is why mm-hmm. I think he tries to get all of his family members to go see it. And every single time they they just kind of brush him off, um, there's a there's a long silence well, yeah, and, there, and and because and, and the rest of the town is pretty offended by it because they are yeah. sitting here going, yeah. you know, like we are experiencing poverty and desperation. Right. We are we are hungry and we are angry, and the only thing that we are getting is like this, you know, this this spectacle, which yeah. is not even a good spectacle. It's a giant stinking carcass, yeah. you know, <laughs> like the you know they're just like, and they expect us with no money and no food and desperately cold to just pay to look at this thing. And like, so like that actually everyone else has a very different response. But what I do find interesting is that tar does get swept up in Janos's response to this, which Mm -hmm. is the idea of there is another world out there. This came from something else. That means that whatever he's currently experiencing, there must be another reality or another world or another system. Something exists out there that is not what he is experiencing. And I think that it does bring some level in some way, even even though it turns out to be bad in the end, even, (laughs) even even though once again, that it's funny how they undermine that as well by being, by showing you that again, this is a fucking where whale carcass right well, so they right. also they show you at the end and only someone this poor and this desperate could imbue that image uh, uh with with yeah, hope absolutely. I, I didn't notice absolutely. until this time around but the whales fake in the last shot um they when georgie goes to see the whale and you see the whales all run down you see like wire mesh poking out around it like you, you see, you see like the skin ripped off and you see, Oh, right. Uh, the undercarriage has like wire mesh around it. Interesting. See, I, I wasn't I sure if that, that was, was just the, them, them, them <laughs> stuffing it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm well, not well, sure because I, because either, I knew I, I, yeah. I, I took I, it as the whale being fake this time around. Yeah, no, I, I interesting. I'm going to have to look for that. it on the next watch. Cause I, I think either way it, it, it absolutely works because yeah. that regardless, that's how it's being used. Yeah, it, it's yeah. being used as this, you know, sort of, uh, this false spectacle that actually relates mm-hmm. to the, um, uh, the, the, the sort of big monologue that his, his uncle guests where the, uh, th- where you get the title of the film from, mm-hmm. um, this idea that, uh, Andreas, uh, workmeisters, uh, I, the harmonic principles, I guess, mm-hmm. are what they called it. And it, it's, it's very funny listening to this rant that he does where he's essentially like he's recording this theoretical observation of, you know, being a sort of composer and someone who is an academic on music that they're basically the, the world became off its axis when this guy popularized this, you know, the system of. <laughs> 
uh, music harmony that, you know, was unnatural and ungodlike. And I, I think he compares it to like the Celestials at one point or something mm-hmm. like that. But the, the, I, I didn't I couldn't quite grasp it all because I am not <laughs> yeah. an academic for that level of, of music and composition. But I, I could very loosely grab this idea of he thinks that they have lost track of the natural tones mm-hmm. of music that the, the the things that his ancestors communicated with gods and created great big things with and instead they have replaced them with these kind of false illusions that they have now bought into for for centuries now and to the point where they no longer know what the real tones and the original instruments and the original music um, sounded like. And it's obviously a, a very, very um, sort of uh, obvious, I guess, kind of uh, political angle to this idea of, you know, we've created, you know, uh, systems of, of you know, uh, living amongst other people that you kind of have the same um, reality with of like, you know, we've become disillusioned by them and they haven't, and we, and they've been going wrong for so long. We don't even remember what the original foundations of goodness were supposed to be about them. We just kind of live and wander the ruins of that. Mm -hmm. Um, and that is the experience of kind of watching this film. So it's interesting to see that it, it applies to his sort of like music theory. And then it also applies to these people bringing, you know, this, uh, this fake, spectacle around to the people to try and uh you know show them something that is you know that is meant to be this uh th- this big real thing that it turns out not to be and the yeah. spectacle is only how the circus is going to seduce people because it's a one two punch of you come and you see the circus and then you hear a speech from the prince which in the movie we I love that we never see him. We never see him. Yeah. We see a shadow and he's this very demonic figure and we only hear the him like getting ready to give his speech we don't actually hear his speech in question but whatever it is it's almost like like a king in yellow kind of thing where people hear it and they just something flips in their head and they just become extremely violent yeah extremely hateful and Mm -hmm. they hear the speech and they go into the town's mental hospital and they just start pulling people out of beds and beating them to death. Yeah. And the way that that's filmed too, like they don't have, um, they, they don't have the patients like screaming or even the people that are doing the beating, uh, like say anything audible. Really? It's, it's, it's very much just them going into the space, grabbing them from the beds. And then you see the beating and you see, you hear like the physical, uh, bats hitting the the flesh. Yeah, the, and all the, of that. the beatings and the but, murders are very obviously happening, but it's yeah. just it's not. So, it's like, intentionally under dramatized. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. It's very matter of fact, and they don't dramat- dramatize it or make anyone you know scream or really fight back. It feels very like they're completely helpless, which you know it, it does make sense. They're in the the hospital, but it, it's uh, it just feels Ooh. like that it's this mob that's taken over completely, and there's just no fighting back whatsoever. Like, yeah, yeah, well, I mean, I, was talking I, I about, think, well, like oh, I ahead. said earlier, you know, the way that so many people act in this movie is very metaphorical, very abstracted, and not really how people act, but how, but what their actions represent, basically. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the violence is just pure mechanical violence, and right. the being killed is just being there's nothing else to it it's very cold and even the uh, realization uh, uh, like when you when they see the old naked man um it's all done through mm-hmm. silence they they look at him they silently realize what they've done and then on mass they decide to retreat yeah so yeah. yeah basically yeah these people go through this mental hospital and beat everyone to death and then they see this like emaciated naked man standing there and instantly mm-hmm. whatever switch them to violence switches off and they just they have this shameful procession out mm-hmm. this yeah. really this funeral march yeah, of funeral march you know. exactly well speaking yeah, of like it's, the it's, mob it's, it's march, really it's a it's a really beautiful moment yeah and, and speaking of the mob march itself before they even get to the hospital once again there's no like shouting of any political statement or a line or anything like that it's just a group a massive group of people with with 
bats and torches or whatever else, just walking the streets and heading towards the hospital. There's there, there's no yeah. emotion or screaming or, or rioting or anything of that nature. It's just people determined to do whatever they're about to do I've been and, and have been incited to do. Yeah, well, I mean, th- th- this, I think, speaks to the sort of larger kind of style that that Tar is going for. And when I was reading up on some of the interviews where he was talking about it, he had a, a really choice um, line that he brought up, which was, um, uh, I despise stories. <laughs> <laughs> they mislead people into believing that something has happened. In fact, nothing really happens when you flee from one condition to another. All that remains is time. There's probably, uh, or this is probably the only thing that's still genuine, time itself, years, days, hours, minutes, and seconds. And this kind of speaks to the way that he approaches scenes like this, where it's like you don't experience, yep. you know, the intense cutting of a guy going in and beating a man and how, you know, you don't get manipulated into how, uh, you know, how scary that must be to this person. You just sit in the mundanity with the passage of time. Like this is a thing that happens in the world and it stems from very real things. And, you know, we will, we wallow in the conditions a little bit that, that led to it. But when it actually hits, it is this perfect combination of this very, you know, this realistic, um, quality that he developed from when he was doing his more social realist elements in terms of the production design and the look and, you know, that kind of element. But then you have the hypnotic dance, like, style of it and the way that the camera glides and and cranes and you know captures this sort of mundane lost wandering existence of these characters you know um you know spending uh you know hoping that spending time with them and doing acrobatics around them will eventually hopefully land on something you know i was really taken by just you sit here and you watch and you're entranced by these images and the movements but you and and you're you wait for the cuts for relief honestly (laughs) because you're like holy fuck we're moving on to something else or vice versa uh in the hospital siege sequence that we were just talking about where the, the tension comes from the fact that it won't let you look away and you're mm-hmm. like, God, I don't want to watch this. I don't want to see this, this, this suffering. Like, please, fucking, let me go, go back to the rusty surfaces and cold wind of walking around outside. Yeah, um, I, I, <laughs> I love his emphasis on just survival, like what people have to do to just survive throughout their day. Like, there's long shots of the the lead just going and picking up the soup and then taking it, putting it on the furnace, mm-hmm. putting it into his his bowl. Scoop, uh, putting the bread inside, yeah. scooping it up, eating it. Like, it, it's just, it, it feels like it would be mundane to watch, but it's just so essential to these people's lives that it feels incredibly significant. Um, and, uh, like, there's even stuff like people sitting next to a, a furnace or just uh, when the the uncle, he wakes up the uncle and he has to take his medication. Um, there's just, like, they, they emphasize those things because it's just part of these people's everyday survival. Absolutely. Yeah, because so much of the movie, I mean, what we're talking about with the prince and the riot, it's the stuff that's easiest to talk about because the big, like, fantastical moments in the film, but so much of the film really is these people caring for each other, or uh, Jana's caring for his uncle, Mm -hmm. most specifically. Um, There's really moving scenes of him, like, he's tucking his uncle into bed, and then he's cleaning the bathroom, and yeah, there's it's like five minutes of the film is him coming home, t- tucking his uncle into bed and making sure that he like takes, you know, his socks off yeah. and, you know, <laughs> yep. like, you know, very, uh, you know, these these details of the kind of care, uh, the, 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 the bored care that you have to put in to really live in this world. Yeah. And, and have, then well, you have that kind of specificity in these mm-hmm. quote unquote mundane details, but then. Things like the prince and the whale and the town or the ideologies are very abstracted, like we mentioned. And yeah. that gives it this very odd quality where it's kind of uh, impossible to define what the movie is or box it in in anything yeah. other than it's like a Bellatar movie. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, it, it really does need to kind of like be experienced to get that. Because, again, sort of like the cremator, it, it is something that is doing two things at once in a way 
that is sometimes disorienting and sometimes or and I guess always, you know, for me anyway, fairly, fairly intriguing. But it is one of those things where you're like, how can this be so specific in the conditions and feelings of mm-hmm. living on the edge of the world like this in the way that he's depicted, but then, you know, introduce these more fable like symbols and then start, you know, applying those feelings so that they start taking over and doing things that are more exaggerated. Like Perry was talking about when, you know, uh, the entire action gestures of this film, when it does get into the elements that people would probably find more exciting to talk about, like the big riot sequences and stuff. Like, it does feel like you are experiencing the, you know, sort of apocalyptic doom of this entire place. You are watching some kind of cosmic altercation um, that's, that's, that's taking um, place that stems from these real feelings of, 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 you know, of these real conditions and these real rage and hollowness and sadness and everything that, and, and you want to, uh, these, these feelings of wanting to revolt. That's why I thought the original book title was like incredible. Perfect. Yeah. The melancholy called- of resistance because these characters want to resist something. That's the thing is they're like, our lives fucking suck. We are hungry. We are cold. We are bored. We don't know what the solution or what the answer is because we have lived like this for so long. Once again, sort of the same thing with the musical theory. They don't remember what they originally uh, fought for or wanted to build in the first place. Instead, they are all sitting around here looking at the corpse of this whale being like, well, what do we do? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, like what is the, what is the next move here? And no one knows, but the prince comes in and tells them, well, I know destroy everything because only in the complete ruin and destruction can you, you know, start to rebuild something else. And it, because he's literally the only person offering a solution, they go, well, you know, Why give not? it a shot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I think that that's just such an important aspect of this, because I, I did read a lot of contemporary reviews at the time that kind of honed in on, you know, this is a very obviously much beloved film, but there were some that mentioned um, and not inaccurately how nihilistic this film um is in a way and and how brutal um it is or i mean like especially like if you were to describe this film and what happens in it to someone especially the fate of our delivery man which is incredibly bleak and and cyclical and metaphorical in that kind of way but is is very disturbing um the thing that i took away from this and the thing that really blew me away was um that it doesn't feel that way it feels incredibly compassionate Um, Yeah, it feels like, you know, it is totally in tune with the confusion and the feelings and the, you know, the 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 loneliness of this town. And it it absolutely wants to end an an end to their desperation and their suffering. Um, It's not something like, oh, sorry, go on. No, go ahead. I was just going to say, it's not saying like. Uh, like irreversible or a, a Lars von Trier movie or something where it's really yeah, it's, nihilistic. It's, it's, not, it's but not shocking in, yeah, well, in a cynical way. And, you and know? It's, like, not, <laughs> it's not like it doesn't view the characters as like, at least Janos and Georgie, it, it doesn't view them as like like little puppets where you can yeah. Yeah. play them around to upset the audience. You know, Bellatar doesn't care. He's not interested in that. He's not here to, you know, shock you and upset you by giving you characters you care about and then doing bad things to them. That, mm-hmm. That's it's not nihilistic in that way. It, no, he's he's he's, he's, he's more interested in 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 just living with them, yeah. following them, not like like observing them is is more the issue. He is not the one who's puppet mastering this situation that's taking place, even though obviously in terms of, you know, writing yeah. and filmmaking, I guess literally you could consider that's what you're doing. But it's just the way that the camera operates and the way that this movie on a formal level feels is that it wants to just really sit with these characters. And these characters do live a kind of in a sort of quiet, haunted you know, kind of purgatory that they found themselves in one of, you know, sort of the repetition of mundane tasks or the, you know, the slow walking of from dilapidated location location to, you know, another sort of like rundown public service building. Um, 
And as Jamie mentioned, even when the big dramatic moments take place, we witness them in this very matter of fact kind of periphery way. Yeah. Um, the symbolic way. Um, and I think that there is just something to be said about how, you know, I really felt that quality to this film and how um, mournful um, it is in its in its dreamlike elegance that it's that it's depicting. And yeah, so I was like that that aspect of it, I thought, you know, was just, you know, like unlike anything I'd, I'd ever seen in that way. I think that, you know, this is, you know, when it kind of ramps up into the big riot stuff and, you know, eventually we do even see on a bigger dramatic level, like, you know, martial law takes into a place. There even is like tanks rolling into town and barbed wire and, you know, the things that we didn't even see in the cremator yet you are still held at a distance from all of that stuff because yeah. some, there is something larger at place here, something, um, you know, sort of more symbolic and, and philosophical and cosmic that you are f- experiencing, even though <laughs> the, the the character himself is being chased down by helicopters and finding, you know, like his dead uncle, um, in the street. Uh, and man, even just that sh- shot of him sitting with his uncle's corpse after the riot. And he just sits with him for like two or three minutes. Um, yeah. and you're just sitting there with him watching that. Uh, it's, it's brutal. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm, it's, yeah, there are parts of me that are even tough to think about, honestly, like it's, it's hard, but again, it doesn't. It doesn't feel nihilistic. I would say. I mean, the the last no. shot in the movie is the sun rising. You know. Yeah. Yeah, I was gonna actually mention that because he does say in the beginning with uh, that that bar display or performance that he puts on that it will finish with the return of sunlight, um, and we finish the mm-hmm. movie with kind of like you know the the fog kind of going over the whale and it, and it gets brighter. It, it feels as if he's saying like, although it, it, you're still in a very horrible state, time is passing and, and something will change. Now, whether or not we know if it's going to be positive or negative, I don't think we'll ever know until it happens, but there, there's, it's going to move forward in some way. It feels like it's not I don't know if I want to say it's hopeful because it doesn't feel that way, especially with the lead <laughs> character and the 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 uncle kind of being forced to live in like this very small uh, space with his his rightly tuned piano, you know, I guess signifying he can't make any uh, changes there. It doesn't yeah, well, feel the, 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 necessarily that's what's like it's it, it like totally doomed entirely. Um it just feels no yeah. because on 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 a plot level it's funny because like if you were to describe the plot of what's taking place that it's very bleak like yeah. this this movie <laughs> comes to its conclusion with you know we we saw the big sort of mental institution siege that took place and it uh the janos character ends up on a list for the military where he was included in the rioters even though he wanted nothing to do with the rioting he just saw it uh, unfold Mm -hmm. and he actually like very quickly runs away when he can start to see where it's going to go. And that great shot of like the prince's shadow that he can see talking to the guy who, you know, runs the, the, the whale show and everything like that while he's hiding in the, in the side. And that great shot too, of complete darkness, except for his face and the whale's eye and stuff like that as well. Like Like incredible images in there. His like him realizing what the prince is going to do to the community is also like the reason he's there is because of the wonder of the whale kind of brought him there and then a a, a lot of truth was exposed when he eavesdropped yeah and and it's it's just very interesting that like you know he runs away from that scenario and you get great moments where like as he's running away in the distance he can hear the the screaming and the fire start rising in the background very slowly and then he starts going back to try and you know figure out what's going on and either way he he ends up in the rubble and the ruins where there was you know arson and there was murder and there was he even reads diary entries of like assaults that were taking place and you know all kinds of nasty shit the town was completely destroyed and he was put on the list of rioters and captured and he gets labeled as a political dis and put into the mental institution where his uncle tells him that, you know, he he's been completely beaten down. You know, all he was trying to do was just, you know, walk around and live and survive in this world. And he had a little bit of hope and it was basically politically beaten out of him. He's been locked in this institution, gone mad. And his uncle is there saying that, 
you know, uh, I'm not going to try and resist the musical theory stuff anymore. <laughs> He's like, I've just let my thing get tuned the way everyone else's is. I'm not going to think about it anymore. And like, that's bleak when you think about it Absolutely. as the overall metaphor of like, you have the, you know, the people who were suffering and desperate deciding to, you know, lash out and destroy and, you know, uh, perform some kind of resistance or revolution as you could think it, even though it goes sort of unnamed. Um, the uncle goes, yeah, maybe that's a bad idea. <laughs> that, that didn't work out. <laughs> so I'm going to not do it with my music or anything either. But w what is interesting is that despite that, the actual ending of this film, uh, you know, despite this very bleak cycle that we've seen um, is, you know, the, 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 the piano melody kicks back in and you get this, this, you know, the uncle finally going to look at the whale corpse and it's, it's hearkening back to the, uh, the, uh, him saying that he wouldn't go and see it with him, but I'm sure your whale will still be beautiful tomorrow. So he is actually going and looking at it tomorrow and it is not beautiful. It is, uh, in the middle of a d destroyed empty street, just sitting there. It's not even positioned as a spectacle. It's just yeah. a corpse in the street now. The crate is um, destroyed around it. Yeah. And and it recreates that incredible tracking shot where he walks around him the same way that um, that Janos did earlier in the film. And he looks in the lifeless eye with with awe. He walks completely around it and it's completely in, uh, enveloped by fog and, and light. And it's just this image of sort of pure awestruck wonder at kind of like the great big things that exist in the world. And throughout the passage of time that you, you know, we some subsequently kind of become either disillusioned with or we literally destroy and kill. And yet the final image of this like ruinous, apocalyptic European town and a man completely alone with no drive to resist the falseness of his world anymore. And the corpse of a beast that symbolized impending doom <laughs> and and possibly God right, uh, I was gonna say, is dead. To Janos, like god and wonder and miracles yeah, yeah. and su surprisingly you know it is mournful and it is painful but i do think that there is a tiny bit of of hope in that light where it is like yep. you know we've just witnessed the most horrifying dreamlike parade of of suffering that someone <laughs> could compose in terms of you know the existential feelings of that suffering so now the sunlight um, has where to he return is, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the way that I kind of described it when I was writing about it was just that, you know, this tar, it feels like Tar chooses to walk and live and and spend the his time with these people and in this place while they are experiencing the worst of this harrowing solar eclipse where they are just locked in the shadows and the darkness and the destruction. Um, but it does so with the hope that tomorrow is the day it ends. <laughs> The light is yeah. coming around the corner. The sun's coming up the same way that his story said is that one day the warmth, you know, will come back and life will come back. Um, and it might not be it might not be tomorrow, but maybe it will be tomorrow, you know. Yeah. And uh, surprisingly, that works. That works for me. I'm sitting there. And it, it felt like when uh, how was it that you described high life when I showed it to you, Jamie? Oh, it's uh, surprisingly hopeful, <laughs> but it drags you through glass to get there. <laughs> There you Something go. Something like that. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, I would agree. Uh, that is kind of how I felt um, watching this um, for the first time. And I found it really, really um, beautiful. Yeah. And uh, yeah. yeah, I think I think maybe pivoting uh, towards reductive rating on this one's probably an uh, easy guess here for me. Uh, a five. <laughs> yeah. Uh, easy instant. five. I... I yeah, instant on the spot. Yeah, credits that, rolled, that, and that I was like, "This is one like, of the best things I've yeah. ever seen in my life." <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think I think that this is, you know, it, as we've mentioned, this is, you know, it's it's lonely and it's moanful and it's spare, it's meditative, uh, dreamlike, and I think that it has just this perfect atmosphere of, you know, doom and sort of like evil on the horizon. And despite that, you can tell that Tar's instinct isn't to shock you with the doomed places that he is going, but to instead totally humanly just sit with these characters and hope that something else is coming. Um, you know, despite all of these horrible conditions that he is depicting and these, you know, you know, these feelings of, of uh, fear and shame and, and suffering and things that they are experiencing in this desperation that... Uh, 
you know, he, he really wants to, you know, uh, sit with these people as they walk around their rusty, cold town, hunched shoulders, these, you know, walking in this way that is very mesmerizing in a, this funeral march quality to it as these characters are wandering the ruins of this world that is just, uh, you know, for them, it's, it's just completely broken and it's not working for them. And uh, they have no idea, you know, what it is that they're going to do and how they're going to handle that. They just, they stare at a giant whale corpse and kind of lost wander the, yeah. uh, the, the crumbled foundations of it. And yeah, I think that, you know, all of that stuff is just unbelievable. And I think Tar's formal capabilities here are unbelievable. Insane. Um, yeah. you know, in, Without really, being like really self-indulgent, like the, you know, it doesn't feel like he's going, look at me. <laughs> it feels very much, yeah. uh, for the story and to express this kind of like vast and empty town that he lives in. Um, but, it, but he does also a lot of like with all the movement and, and following and lack of cutting, he does a lot of close ups with the lead. So you still get a very personal feel to it. It's just that you're attached to him a lot of the time. Um, but anyway, continue. Yeah, no, I, I just think that like the, the, some of the compositions he comes up with here, I think are, they, they feel ghostly and they feel desolate um, and they, they capture the experiences of, of these characters' lives in their world and the level of control he has over them is, you know, it's, it, it's something that really makes you want to meditate on what it is that he's showing you. Um, yeah. And yeah, I, I mean, I think his instincts are all correct when it comes to, you know, depicting a huge sort of siege murder sequence and shooting it in the exact same way that he would observe a character walking down the street. You <laughs> yeah. know, these are things that are happening. This is just the passage of time. And then combining that with, as Perry mentioned, this, these more sort of mystic fable like qualities, these, these symbols, this prince that we never see who is able to talk the town into, you know, and exploit their suffering to, you know, um, extend it even further. Um, or this giant rotting whale corpse that somehow, you know, is obviously just a very ugly image and sitting in the middle of this, you know, nondescript Hungarian town square, but is also because of the way that these characters' lives and, you know, the sort of austere realism of their conditions, it's also something that, whatever, for whatever reason, it symbolizes a uh, something else exists out there in the world and maybe we could find it if we walk around right. long enough and yeah the fact the fact that he can do all of this that he can do something that feels so perfectly combines this social realism thing that he kind of grew up getting involved in and then mix it with this dreamier sort of filmmaking style i found it just incredibly impressive and for anyone who wants more of this stuff obviously check out some bellatar but i also wanted to throw in um, a film that I think I've recommended to you before, um, Jamie, mm. and I didn't realize was as inspired by Tar until I watched this. But uh, I saw a film at the Toronto Film Festival in 2018 called An Elephant Sitting Still. Oh, yeah. It was a Chinese film. I've wanted to watch that. By, That's um, a... Hu, Hu Bo. Yeah, he, um, was a, he was a student Hu... of Bellatar's. And then, yeah, and oh, then wow. I read up, he was actually a prodigy of Tar and basically yeah. specifically tapped by him to continue his style. And he applied it to a present day China in that in really intriguing and depressing um, ways before uh, taking his own life, unfortunately. Uh, and the, the, the four hour runtime of the film is quite daunting. Um, but the crushing weight of it is the only thing resembling Tar's use of duration. Uh, in, in his images uh, as something that's both kind of painful and compassionate at the same time that I've that I've seen um, since. So I, I would really recommend checking out this film. And obviously, I'm going to be exploring more tar uh, oh, yeah. as of now. But, you know, if, 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 if this style intrigues you at all, that's the only other thing that I've seen that uh, really reminds me of this and the, the level of compassion and um, sort of loneliness uh interchangeably that it captures with these characters so yeah check it out yeah i'm also gonna five it um i just this was beautiful haunting depressing sad it's it's many 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 things uh i love the way that it's filmed i think the kind of slow uh 
floating camera is is genius and it emphasizes the the loneliness the isolation the coldness it's it's just brilliant um uh one shot that i wanted to include just because i didn't mention it i don't think is when he is talking to uh his uncle about the the whale and he wants him to go visit it and the uncle just kind of dismisses him what he does to emphasize this like this kind of, uh, I guess, once again, isolation and, and dismissiveness of something that is wondrous to him um, is that uh, Bellatar just focuses on them walking together completely silently, not talking after the dismissal of, of the whale. And it just feels like, you know, he's, he's trying to uh, extend something that he's seen that he, he finds very intriguing to someone that he loves and cares about. And because of the, the circumstances of the society and and the systems at play, they just, he, he the, the uncle can't be bothered with it. Um, and I thought that that was just... Well, and, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, too, but in that shot, if I recall correctly, he's, uh, they also split ways down two different streets, oh, which I yeah. thought was really awesome. Yeah, that's a great like, shot. Like, it, it holds that long yeah, shot of them the walking the together. Yeah. Yeah, and at the end of the shot, they go different directions entirely. Yeah. Uh, because it holds that shot for so many minutes that you actually get to see them start at the front of the frame and then end up like all the way at the end of it, just walking the entire way. <laughs> mm. And I love the way that he emphasizes like the emptiness of the town um, because pretty much every time that he's walking anywhere, he's the only one on the street. And the only time that you really see people grouped together is when there's the mob scene and when they're uh, all coming together because the, the whale is going in the middle of the courtyard. Every other time, he's just completely by himself or he's with his uncle. And like you said, even when he's with his uncle, they emphasize the, the separation and the isolation even when they're going to their own homes and, and they're on their sh the streets mm -hmm. that they live on. So, yeah, it's just it, there, there's so much to this. I, I, I absolutely adore it. Um, and... Strangely enough, mm -hmm. even though I think it's very, you know, it is dark and nihilistic to a degree. Dread inducing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I do think that he's, he's, he's trying to say, it's still not saying whether or not it's a positive or negative, but time does pass and things will change. It's just a matter of how much. Um, and so there, there is a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel when the, the, the sunlight returns over the decaying whale carcass um <laughs> yes. so so yeah there's a lot there's a lot to to balance there but he, he does a fantastic job so yeah a uh, masterpiece well and and five. and that in that last shot he's you know the uncle is connected to you know his his nephew there yeah. as well in that moment where he's having yep. the exact same experience that that he had in, and they get uh, the formally. same shot where he stares into the dead uh, whale eye and everything um, yeah. uh, although it's, it's like there's a little bit more wonder with with uh, Janos where the uncle is kind of like, oh, man, I probably there's a little bit more regret in the in yeah, the uncle's the uncle yeah. is thinking, oh, I probably should have gone yesterday. <laughs> so, yeah. So, yeah, five out of five. Really great stuff. Yeah. For you, Perry. Um, I think I'm also going to go with a five. It's interesting because it's so obviously a great film. But mm -hmm. since the first time I saw it, I've seen two other Bellatar films, which I think are also, like, great films and kind mm -hmm. of, like, greater films, which oh, makes nice. weighing it so hard, but also, like... That just makes me excited. <laughs> I mean, it, it, well, yeah, yeah, it's... If I divorce it from, like, how monumental I think Say and Tango and the Turin Horse are, then, like, yeah, it's obviously a five-star movie. It's great. <laughs> it's, it's so... Be it's beautiful, and it's haunting, and it's... It's one of those movies that, again, it's just unlike anything else that you can just watch it for the rest of your life and take something from it. Yeah. It's a really nourishing work of art. And, yeah, I, I yeah. would highly urge everyone listening to give it a shot. Yes, please do. Yeah, I mean, uh, personally, I, I can't wait to go back to it, ex except mm. for the fact that it's a fucking crime that somehow this is not on Blu-ray yet. Well, yeah. That's so wild. this can only be found on, like, DVD rips. Yeah. Um, and it's one of the most, even on a, you know, like a subpar DVD rip, this is one of the most beautiful movies that I've yeah. I've ever looked at. Yeah. The so, old Facets DVD still looks good. <laughs> it's pretty yeah. nice. That's crazy. So <laughs> I, someone needs to upgrade this and so that we can even get more um, out of these images of uh, 
people being sad and walking around a desolate Hungarian town and staring at a a, a whale carcass in the middle of their town uh, and thinking about existence. <laughs> Satan Tango only got a I, Blu-ray I like uh, late 2020, I think. Okay, well, it's maybe it's on the way. Yeah, on maybe, the way. yeah. I know Damnation got a restoration recently, so fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. All right, well, I think that that will wrap it up uh, for this week's episode. That was The Cremator from 1969 and Workmeister Harmonies from uh, 2000. That'll be it for our you know, incredibly uh, depressing <laughs> descent into uh, Eastern European yeah, you brought the sadness, uh, <laughs> feelings. Yeah. Uh, 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 yeah, next time I'll bring some gross Japanese movies again. Yeah, we're either Lighten crying or yes. vomiting. That's, that's the two <laughs> channels yes. that you like to bring to the show. Those yeah, are Perry's that, that's, modes. Yeah, that's a Perry guarantee. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks so much, Ferry, for uh, for joining this, joining us, and for bringing these films with you. If you've got anything uh, to plug while you're here, what's going on in Perry world? Yeah, yeah well, um, recently I've had some short fiction published in a couple books. Nice. Uh, the book of Queer Saints just came out yesterday. I have a story in that called Eclipse or the Courtship of the Sun and Moon, which is a uh, a very odd gothic homoerotic story about ballet and then i have a story uh, actually heavily inspired by the film site in tango called the melody of frostbite in the anthology pluto infers volume two so if you like uh gay horror fiction if you like kind of weird dark stuff i bring on the mo- onto the show uh, you might like some of my fiction so go check it out Nice. Yeah, go check it out. And check out the, uh, uh, for, the short film, uh, Sungazer. Yeah, yeah Sungazer, can, 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 yeah. Can, can, can uh, people still rent it? Uh, you can still rent Sungazer, yeah. Uh, rent it out. Please Sungazer is on it. Vimeo. Good. You can go check it out. It is actually the only short film to be on the best of list of the Sleazoids podcast. So It's true. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm just no saying. No other one you know, has made the list. You want to see the Sleazoid's greatest short film of all time. Great there you go. You can go watch it there. That's right. Hell yeah. We can definitely recommend doing that. Um, for our listeners, we are going to be back in one week's time over on the Patreon, uh, going a little bit of body horror mode to prep for the, uh, the, the episode two weeks from now. We're going to be talking about one, The Incredible Shrinking Man, Woo. which is... Um, the uh, 1957 Jack Arnold film, which is, I guess, kind of an early precursor to what body horror would be. It's literally just yeah. a guy losing control of his body, but it has this atomic age kind of anxiety to it. And the, the analog right effects and how they make him shrink are unbelievable. Yeah. And we're going to be pairing that with uh, a film called Spontaneous Combustion <laughs> by Toby Hooper from 1990 Love starring Hooper. Brad Dourif, which is literally about a dude whose parents basically experimented uh, uh, nucle- nuclear technology on him and it turns into a body horror film from there. So it it's a uh, Toby Hooper's throwback to kind of atomic age anxiety, kind of like monster and mad scientist kind of movies. So uh, we're going to have fun watching Toby Hooper get down and dirty. And then, and that's 1990. I think that'll be the mm. latest Toby Hooper film we've talked about officially. And I, I thought it was pretty underrated when I watched it. So we're going to pair those two together next week over on the Patreon. And then the week after, with a guest, we are going to be back and we are going to be doing one, a heavy hitter, David Cronenberg's The Fly, probably the biggest David Cronenberg movie that we haven't talked about on the show. And it's going to be paired with Saul Bass's Phase 4, which I haven't seen. I haven't seen, but I've I've heard that it it must have some sort of bug in it. This is a bug (laughs) double feature, I've been assured. Is that right, Perry? Oh, if you if you love ants, it's the perfect movie for ants. Okay, noted. My girlfriend hates ants, so we will not be watching that together. <laughs> I'm glad I got this warning in advance. I would have gotten a lot of trouble. Um, but yeah, so that's what you can expect in uh, in two weeks' time. But uh, that being said, that wraps it up for everything this week. Thanks so much for listening, and keep it sleazy. Keep it sleazy. Yeah.